What's up, Mark Bell's Power Project fam? This episode is brought to you by Piedmontese Beef. Now, Andrew, you guys know that we've been working with Piedmontese for a long time. We love mm-hmm. their beef. It's tender. It tastes great. But they have this awesome bundle called the Power Project Deluxe Bundle. Deluxe. Okay. Andrew, can you please tell the people <laughs> what they can get in this bundle? Yeah, I don't see the Deluxe Bundle, but I see the Deluxe Bundle. Yes, the Power Project Deluxe Bundle. Uh, really, this is where I tell people like, hey, if you don't know exactly which cuts that you like, this is where you're going to want to start because you're going to get a full array of the like entire spectrum of amazing cuts from Piedmontese beef. Real quick and see, let me let me know what you think about this. Four flat iron steaks, four flank steaks, hmm. one tomahawk ribeye steak. Oh, That's king right there. Yeah. Uh, 20 space, six ounce ground beef patties, not 26, 20. All right. Four eight ounce grass fed, grass finished New York strips. Those are incredible. Mm. And two grass-fed, grass-finished Bavette steaks, the, quote, diet steak, because they're, like, yay big, uh, like 100 grams of protein. They're insane. Seriously, though, if if you're not sure where to start, this is definitely where you want to go. Um, and in order to get this, you have to go to Piedmontese.com. That's P-I-E-D-M-O-N-T-E-S-E.com. At checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT for 25% off your order. And if your order is $99 or more, you get free two-day shipping. Quick caveat, that code will not work on this bundle because you're already saving a ton of money with this bundle. However, once you get this and you figure out exactly what you like, then you can go make your own little bundle yourself and then use that promo code and still get 25% off. Head over there right now. What up, Power Project crew? This is Josh Selledge, aka Settlegate, here to introduce you to arguably our most interesting guest ever, Tom File. Tom File is one of the most interesting OG members of Super Training Gym and is a longtime friend of Mark and Chris Bell. Tom is a powerlifter and bodybuilder, an IPL Masters World Champion, and a 242-pound national and world record holder in powerlifting. Tom File first met the Bell brothers in Venice, California while working at Gold's Gym. During his time at Gold's Gym, Tom rubbed elbows with some of the best bodybuilders in the entire world, movie stars, and celebrity trainers. Tom has a wealth of experience in the gym, on the platform, and on the bodybuilding stage, and is one of the few lifting legends whose neck is thicker than his own head. Tom File was also involved in one of the biggest multi-million dollar heists in San Francisco history. But that's a different story for another day. Please enjoy the most interesting conversation you've ever heard with our good friend and guest, Tom File. Yeah, keep the butt plug. That's in Seema's room. I don't know why he made It's in Seema's butt plug. Oh, that's disgusting. No, it's not. I don't usually use other people's butt plugs. You should. <laughs> it's already lubricated. <laughs> already ready to go. Well, it, it uh, doubles as a pacifier as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's best yeah. to use it as a pacifier first. I just heard that, unfortunately. a butt plug. This uh, pad is almost right? all full, filled up. Hey, guys, a technical question. With these mics, if, if he's speaking... Will it not let me speak at the same time? Nope. You guys, you guys can, can speak, speak over, can speak over each other, which is not great. But this is called a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> the best thing to do is the point is to else. talk when everybody else you is talking. You fuck off too. Get a yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, unfortunately, we can talk over each other. So that's thank you in the TV yeah, business. Thanks. As Chris may know, if he's talking. I can't just cut in. Correct. Then it'd be jibber jabber. You've been in a uh, show business before. This is, uh, I think, the this next ain't show business. I was going to say. The next three hours is going to be the biggest waste of time. I will be on hair and makeup. Three hours? I don't know. Two hours? Okay. We can, can, we, can we find three hours here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can find three hours. What's that? I don't Chris? think this mic is on. Oh, that mic on. is definitely on. You wrote the on. script, you right? You to speak loud now. <laughs> Got it. You got the script? Yeah, it's all about cancel. We're pretty sure Chris is uh, sleep deprived. I love the heavy breathing that's going on on the mic. Right Fuck now. off! <laughs> I was going to say, can you tone down my audio? Um, hey, la- like last week, LA Tahoe, I'm in the elevator. Some lady, she had to be 86 years old. She goes, how you doing, son? I said, pretty good. She goes, altitude bothering you too? I said, I'm sorry, ma'am. She goes, I hear you breathing. God damn it. She, had to, she was close to 90, and she could hear me breathing. I was standing in an elevator doing nothing. <laughs> Evidently gasping for air. I, I said, thank you for your, for your uh, concern. I'll be okay. Is uh, the McDonald's a special thing for today, or do you normally eat like this like what's going on they're everywhere i see they're, you see, they're all went down the 
down here at the corner. All the, made there, all <laughs> yeah, the so nothing special. <laughs> I was running on time, so I had to stop at McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> is it special nutrition for you? I mean, is this a special occasion being on the podcast, well, celebrating, perhaps? It is tasty, but uh, to be honest, that um, at 59 years old, my AM hypothalamus function is about what his overall function is right now, is zero point. <laughs> it's not very good. <laughs> what? He seems kind of sleepy. I'm just saying. He seems sleepy. My hypothalamus is, which causes hunger or not. Um, I'm not hungry in the morning, so this I can eat and get some calories in uh, and hopefully maintain some muscle mass. It's motivating. I love it, that, that. Yes. That's what he does because he's Cause not hungry. <laughs> he gets three sausage McMuffins because he's not hungry. That's correct. I was not hungry. <laughs> and I knew if, but if I, I'd come here, we'd talk for a couple hours. I still wouldn't eat. It'd be 11 o'clock. And I'd have zero calories. How mm. many calories are in three sausage McMuffins? I think in SEMA probably. 1440. <laughs> oh, there you go. Wait, really? I be, uh, think well. That sounds about right because there's a lot of fat in each I, one. I think four seventy five each. Wow. Times three. Math guys over there. You said sa- is it okay. sausage McMuffin? The, the sausage egg McMuffin. Sausage egg McMuffin. So everything with you is geared towards your performance, not necessarily taste or um, no, no taste. No, not too much like physique. Well, unfortunately, I still want to be. I still want to look like a guy who lifts weights or a bodybuilder. Bodybuilders, their look is very cool. Other things about bodybuilding are unusual, but bodybuilding is still very, very cool, in my opinion. So, um, this is this is the exception. I don't. This is the first cheap meal of the day, and hopefully, it'll be hopefully it'll be the last cheap meal of the day. But it probably won't be. So, fuck off. How many cheap meals do you have Dude, it's per week? How many? Like, what is this week? diet? Yeah, what is this diet? Forty. I, what do you mean? No. Forty. <laughs> Forty. In SEMA, you're probably aware of this, and you yeah. probably remember. But even though it was before your time, I'm sure you did your research. Do you remember the Don Ross neck competition? <laughs> <laughs> no, but apparently all of you do. So in that's form, hard. You please. really don't know. About I it. don't know. You have a pretty big neck. I figured you'd be in the know. Don the Ripper? all of you guys apparently know what it is. So what is it? What is this Don Ross uh, neck competition? <laughs> in 1993, Don Ross was the editor of Muscular Development <laughs> Magazine, and Don proposed and put into place the Don Ross World's Most Muscular Neck Competition. (laughs) And back then, before the internet, of course, he only advertised it in the magazine. So circulation was, I don't know, 100,000 people back then. And the magazine came out like a month before the month month listed on the calendar on the ca- on the magazine so uh, i think we only had about 10 entrants and you had, you had, oh that's so that's weird the only way to enter the contest was to take a picture of your neck and mail it into don ross <laughs> okay other than me that's a fetish yeah I, <laughs> I actually hung out with don almost every day so don said hey before we get the winners in before we get the pictures in let's do an article on your neck training routine i said great so we met at gold's gym one day and i he shot like 72 pictures of my neck training routine <laughs> and some of, some of them were kick ass but i didn't win don didn't give it to me no i didn't win I didn't is he win. still alive if he was, I'd kill him. If he I was going to say, we got to call him out. Don is gone now, fortunately. Mm. But, um, Wait, so I, nothing was published. He just has all those pictures of your neck? No, well, no, no. They, they, they made the magazine. They made, okay. It was from kind of wall. published because it was on the wall of gold, right? No, that, that was one of them. That was that was probably the highlight of my bodybuilding career, nice. and maybe even my entire existence, <laughs> um, as being on that wall for all those years, and people taking pictures of that picture, which is always kind of strange. Yeah, I said, turn around, I'm right over here. You can take a picture of me. I'm right here. You know what's awesome? And they were the picture, but they wouldn't take a picture of me. They wanted the picture. It, it's great. It's a great honor to have your picture on the wall at Golds, and that was always a it's, goal of it mine. Was the coolest was to get some sort of picture up there. And so when I made bigger, stronger, faster, I was so excited to finally get the poster on the wall and I have my autograph on it and they were like sorry we can't put your poster on the wall because your movie's about steroids shut up <laughs> no they did not this no, whole not. building's about steroids the whole no. building's based on anabolic steroids good lord the parking lot the fence the tree the bush the house the house the juice built wouldn't put it up oh man that's a bummer yeah sorry so, about that now that they have new owners maybe I should try again give it a try give it a go maybe yeah people, you know, time goes it's by been people. a long people time forget. I was so excited but then they just told me no yeah. remember Brian Reagan pulled that gun on the guy on the front desk and threw him out for six months he's back in so <laughs> You know, they time time heals everything. Thank you, Tom. That was Mike Ryan's first day, also on the job. <laughs> oh no, that yeah. was his first day. Yeah, first day on Gun the job. Gunplay at the front desk during my first day. Okay. Yes, sir. Question from the far end. You mentioned the unusual oh, side no. of bodybuilding, and that had me that like perked my ears up. Mm. Whoa. So, what do you mean about the unusual side? Well, wow. It's um. First of all, bodybuilding is hey, not now. A, bodybuilding is not a sport, Mark Bell. It's an art. It's the art of bodybuilding. Okay. Um, you don't have to be an athlete to be a bodybuilder. You have to be an artist to be a winning bodybuilder. 
And um, if any artist you guys know, he's an artist with TV and film and movies. Um, artists do a lot of weird things. There's, there's no <laughs> there's no science behind what he does. There's a little bit of science, but there's not very much. So all the weird stuff. Um, it accompanies it. Sure, it, it's just in, it's not only in the peripheral. It's it's right there in the mix. I mean, if you want to be a competitive bodybuilder. You need to be prepared for the weird because it's out there. You get into weird stuff. I mean, like you're you get so obsessed with the the human body, right? That uh, people end up half naked or all the way naked, and people get fetishes around it and the whole thing, right? I mean, for years it goes in that people would walk up to you and say, "Tom or Chris, check this out." They pull their pants off and drop their pants in the parking lot or at McDonald's or in the gym. Be standing in their little boxer briefs or or sometimes not like, "Do what are you doing?" And they want to show you their thigh cuts. Yeah, VMO. That, that my VMO. My VMO. <laughs> the back mirror, of course, they call you back there, but it frequently be anywhere at all, even in the, in the parking lot or at a bar. Like, do what are you doing? You know, uh, posing room means it's getting serious. Well. If you went to the posing room, you expected guys to get naked, so that was no problem there at all. Hopefully, they had on some briefs or something underneath, but sometimes they did, and you're like, dude, what are you doing? But, um, yeah, that's, and that's kind of weird, but after time... We yeah. need that kind of culture here, I think. Yeah, we have Tom. <laughs> Tom does that. <laughs> the I other Tom. He pulls his pants down and starts flexing his quads. He is exactly this, correct. And just, sure. when, you, when you see it, when you see someone's jeans down by their ankles, you think, hey, what's going on? Is this just, you it's think just weird? Truck stop. About, how, is it really weird? <laughs> I don't know, but it's just kind of weird. Like, that same thing at a truck stop bathroom you're going like wait a minute that's got a different meaning <laughs> but it is the exact same thing you just know truckers there ain't no truck stop so that's bodybuilding sort of I remember it's an what? art it's not a sport what's uh one of the yes. weirdest oh, experiences you've had at gold's gym like what's Lord. uh because you, you've been through it all and you've kind of seen it all working there I and mean, you've seen some crazy things happen, right? Well, there's, just, there's so many excellent things. Some things we probably shouldn't talk about. But um, no, no. I was talking it. to Brother Bell earlier today. Pardon me for reaching across. And um, my buddy Danny McCoggan worked at the front desk one of his first days working. And at Gold's Gym Venice, you'd walk in, and the member would give the give their membership number to the kid at the desk. He'd type it in, and in you go. One seven zero eight five. Correct. There that you was go. my number. I know. I stole it. Because <laughs> <laughs> so oh, you were a fugitive. You had no money. I had no money. <laughs> That's right. Who, who's, wait, you stole what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, Whose used, number was that? My number. I'd use his number. Wait, what number did you use? My number, but I, I love it. It I was Cancun. He didn't yes, care. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, he didn't care. That would work. No one had a membership there, I don't think. That's beautiful. I love that. It works perfectly. <laughs> anyway, this guy walks in. He goes through. I didn't really notice anything. And my buddy Danny goes, hey, Tommy, come here, quick. And I walk over to the, to the check-in area. I go, what's up? He goes, he points over at the water fountain. And he says, hey, see that bum over there by the water fountain? That bum just stole Keanu Reeves' membership. <laughs> and I, I had to <laughs> <laughs> the guy with, but he said, I said, wait, what? That bum stole Keanu Reeves' membership? What are you talking about? And he explained that guy walked in, the bum, and gave this number. And on the monitor on the screen, it was clearly Keanu Reeves. So I look over there at the water fountain, and I went, you idiot, that is Keanu Reeves. And it was actually Keanu Reeves, and he wasn't a bum. He was totally cool. But it goes to Venice. Again, everyone showed up. Once. Everyone eventually makes it to Gold's Gym Venice. And Keanu, back in the mid-90s, had kind of a grunge, disheveled appearance. He was totally cool. A real gentleman and a really cool cat. But uh, my buddy thought he was um, had somebody had stolen Keanu's membership, which did not happen. Gold's Gym had everybody. Like, uh, had all the top bodybuilders. It had people like Magic Johnson coming through there, Michael Jordan, uh, Kobe Bryant, James Caan. Like, there were tons of actors, actresses. It was stunning. Um, Mark, Mark, your brother, your boss, was cool enough last week to call my girlfriend and leave her birthday greetings on her cell phone, on yeah. her voicemail. And um, her name is Cindy. And uh, Cindy goes, that's not Mark Bell. And I said, it's Mark Bell's voice. She goes, I've heard Mark Bell's voice, and that's not his voice. I said, look, that was Mark Bell who called. And I was, that got me thinking, who did I know at the time, like right now, who do I know, what celebrity can I call? Tom's really gone downhill over here. <laughs> I'm the only paper. celebrity in the list. And at one time, it would have been either James Caan or Gina Davis or Keanu Reeves or even Arnold. I could have called them and said, hey, Arnold, can you call my girlfriend and give her birthday greetings? And now it's smelly. <laughs> Not, don't say it that way. Now it, now it is smelly. <laughs> and he, but he came through for me like a champion. And again, my girl goes, that's not him. I said, yes, it's definitely him. So um, she either was stunned that I knew you or she was stunned that I knew you. Which way, either way you want to take that. So um, it was pretty cool, Bell. So thank you, sir. No problem. Yeah. Did it work for you? <laughs> I was At the time, I was in the doghouse, and it did work a little bit. It, it didn't hurt. So um, again, it was appreciated. 
So, and most guys wouldn't take that time, but Brother Bell did it. So, but uh, uh, I gotta ask for that favor once in a while. Have he's right there, calling, yeah. And have him start calling checks for me. Well, you, you can probably call um, you can call that guy congressman that looked bad on the who's Waxman. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You call That's that guy. Gonna be, <laughs> take the phone call for you. <laughs> You've been into powerlifting forever. What um, got you sparked into powerlifting? And, you know, you continued on that path. You were obviously, like, really into bodybuilding also, but you seem to lean now more towards powerlifting. What got you on the powerlifting path, and why did you start in the beginning? You're, also, we should say that you have, like, a world record, right? Well, right now, Some unfortunately, sort of. I do not have any of the four world records. Of course, in powerlifting, there's four possible world records. Get out. Squat, bench press, deadlift, mm -hmm. or total. I got to leave now? Is it? I'm out. <laughs> No, uh, the, of the four world records, I've held, um, I've held three of the four in my weight class and age group, but um, right now I hold none of them. Mm. They've all been broken. Complete failure. The squat, I can get back. It's close. What but was that record? I had it at six oh six. A guy broke it with six eleven. Ooh. So um, I just need to go. And at what age? Fifty eight. You did that. I did it at fifty seven. We were in the fifty five to fifty nine age group at the U at the IPL Masters World Championships. That's no joke. It was um I was thrilled with six oh six. He was a little stronger. The next year, um, Edward Zimmerman is the guy who broke my record. I think he still holds it. Uh, the bench press is way out of my league. It's in the low fours. So that's whoever has that. I, I think it's a guy from Iceland that set. And I had the deadlift at six forty four. But last year. A lifter whose name I cannot remember, unfortunately, he pulled six ninety nine, six six ninety nine, yeah, six ninety nine. So he knocked that way up there, and um, I can't get that back either, unfortunately. But the total is sixteen oh five, and that I I can get again, I think. So the squat and the total war records I hope to reclaim this year if things go well. Did you have a time period where you stopped powerlifting? Absolutely, probably. Well, a couple of them, but um. I suppose in the late 80s, I raced bicycles for a while, so which is um, oh, wow. a long way from powerlifting. A lot of bodybuilders get into bicycle racing, strangely enough. So um, there is kind of a little the correlation between the two sports, strangely enough, once again. But um, Like cycling long distances or? Um, bicycle racing, um, criterium, road races. Um, you know, well, it's great a, cardio. Phenomenal right, so. cardio. But like on a track or like? Well, you know. I've raced the velodrome as well. It's funny you mentioned that. The the banked short track is Because that makes velodrome. a little bit more sense to me for, for, for a power oh, athlete. Oh, yeah. Keen observation there. Most track racers are a lot beefier because in, in a track course, there's no hills. And the longest events are very short compared to road events, so all this, all that muscle doesn't hurt at all on the track. So um, I raced the track successfully for a couple of years, a lot of fun. Things happen real fast, but um, during those years, I was still lifting weights, but I certainly wasn't competing in the sport of powerlifting. Uh, my, my first competition was back summer 1980, cool. and the last thing was August last year. So, do you um, think it would be possible to maintain any of the strength from your youth, or like if you were to lift straight through, is it is it I mean, I don't know. Do you think it would even be possible for yourself? Because you did squat over 800 pounds. I think you deadlifted over 800 pounds. And I think you benched around 600 pounds. Something like that? I appreciate the, um, <laughs> the numbers. It's, um, they're, 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 those are very strong numbers. They weren't quite that good. But um, I, once you hit those numbers up, up here, once you've, once you've bench pressed 500 pounds, you always tell yourself you can do it. Hmm. Um, can I still bench, bench press 500? Of course not. But I, I like to think if I wasn't injured or didn't have surgeries, I could do it. And um, you're always motivated, or you, you know you, you've done it, and, you, and hell, if you have to, you can do it again. So did the strength, did I maintain the strength over all those years? I think in a way I did. Um, once I got back on the gas at Gold's Gym <laughs> and sort of lifted weights, I mean, I, I was repping 405 really, really quick. I think one of the few things Michael Hearn ever acknowledged is something like, all right, he can move a little weight around, because he was never complimentary to, to anybody no. other than himself. Um, and he's very, very strong. He's good looking too. But um, I think I rep like four, maybe 405 or six. He's been very complimentary lately, though. Is, 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 is he mellowed in his old age? Yes. What? Uh, what? Tell think, me more. Uh, How old is her now? 53, 54? 53. I think he's just so, like at a point where he's finally just like realizes, you know, he's pretty awesome. <laughs> and he's just like, <laughs> okay, I don't need to. <clears throat> well, no, in a good way, you know, like. Um, he's maybe finally over it. I don't think he's over it. I don't think he's <laughs> even close bit. to getting over it. A little bit. But um, once again, we can't, I mean, we we'll find some fault, but then there's so much good. I mean, his physique, it's crazy. He could be a competitive IFBB pro right now. Yeah. Um, I don't think he could be a competitive high level powerlifter right now. He could do okay. But the combination of his physique, 
his strength in the powerlifting events, and he's, he's strong in everything in the gym. It's, you know, seated side laterals, behind the neck presses. There's nothing he's weak at. Not a single cable, you know, upright cable rows with the stack. Like, what do you, what, dude, how do you do that? Is he the strongest person you've ever seen? Being at Gold's Gym that long, I mean, you saw the Barbarian Brothers. You saw Jeep Swenson used to go and curl 225 for reps as part of his workout. You know, as strong as Mike is, Mike was and still is. Um, no, no. The question you ask is that's a heavy question right there. So a lot of big strong cats came through there. So um, I don't know who gets the title of the strongest. If you guy. had, but boy, Mike still, oh if Mike had, still might be strongest overall. If you had to do a decathlon, and Mike and I have talked about this, oh. he said that he would challenge anybody in the world to like a 10 lift thing you know so like uh yeah and, and then like hey you get to pick five i get to pick five so it could be like bench squat deadlift but also you might have a military press or a you know a dumbbell curl you know strict or something tom file is willing to put three uh sausage <laughs> egg McMuffins. mcmuffins on the line for the winner of that so I know, contest i know mike <laughs> has said that he would he basically wouldn't be afraid to go up against anyone i don't know if he didn't necessarily say he would win but he said he would challenge anybody and be cool with that because he thinks over 10 exercises that like he can kind of beat anybody. He could beat most people. Most I'd people. like to see a Larry Reels, Michael Hearn thing. Like oh, that. Yeah. That, would, that, no, would no, be, no, that would be the competitor right there. Yeah. yeah. Great That's choice because he's strong at everything too. <laughs> and his name, we found his name instantly. He came up with his reference real quick. There's a lot of other guys that move a lot of weight around that we don't know about. Mm -hmm. They're big and strong. Now, maybe a weight class restriction or if somebody's too much heavier than Mike and Larry, or, they got a, a little a slight penalty of some sort. If you, if you look at like Ed in his prime, Ed was doing stuff that a lot of people don't know, like Ed Cohen. Yeah, four four oh five, you know, behind the neck press and stuff like that. So. I didn't know that. Oh yeah, Ooh. yeah, yeah. There's some, bench five eighty five raw. There's some crazy videos with Ed Cohen where you're like, he might be kind of the strongest thing to ever hit the planet. You know, <sighs> boy, I, I never saw. And then Ed do. says Adrenus efficus. So if you talk to Ed, yeah. he'll say the, the boy, pure oh strongest he's ever seen well, there, yeah, 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 yeah. is Adrenus. I um, never saw Zadrudis. Zadrudis. Yeah, yeah. Boy, Big what Z. is that? Four hundred five? Uh, yeah, Z well, yeah, or three eighty-five or so. Zadrudis Savickas uh, won the Arnold uh, Strongman competition eight years in a row and just completely annihilated everybody. Legendary. They just right smashed there. everybody. Like, now he looks like Zadrudis' younger brother. He looks yeah. great. He's down to shape. 265, 270. He's still a big, big man, but it looks great. He's like a off-season bodybuilder. So he's a lot healthier, and good for him for doing that. Do you have an end in sight with your powerlifting? Like, do you are you like, hey, let me get these numbers, and then I'll just chill and maybe move on to some because powerlifting <clears throat> and taking anabolics and stuff is not the healthiest thing when you're at your age, right? It's incredibly unhealthy. And you ask a really good question. I mean, in the gang, we sit down sometimes to talk about it, and um, you know, you've got to have an exit strategy um, from from the sport of powerlifting, and. Um, to be honest, I I, um, I don't have an exit strategy. It's just to um. You love it. I, I, I if I don't do this, I don't know what else I'm going to do. I mean, I'll, I'll find something to take take up the time, but I'm, I just like doing this stuff. And um, being if somebody calls me a powerlifter, what does that mean in the real world? It doesn't mean a whole lot, but to me, it's still pretty cool. So um, I don't have an exit strategy that's any good. I had one where I just you know, step on the gas as hard as I can. And ride the train to that. Without end. powerlifting, you'd be in prison. <laughs> <laughs> Again. No, I, I, but no, no, no. That, that's not important right now. Um, I mean, they have powerlifting there. Remember, we saw that do. documentary. Yeah, they do. You get jacked in we prison. Watched, we watched a whole documentary about it. They had excellent cool. powerlifting meets in prison. They're well organized, and um, they had a lot of motivation. They're good for the boys. How many have you won? I've won six of those, by the way. <laughs> I've, had, I've had success. But um, I was an experienced powerlifter. So um, I had an advantage of some of the guys. They were just um, br brutally strong and good athletes, but I had been a former competitive power just under the rules, and I um, had a huge advantage of some of those guys. So, um, I mean, they were good competitors, but um, I, I, I knew how to squat and I knew how to deadlift, and they didn't. So uh, even as strong as all of those guys were, I could usually get the best of them in competition. Mm. But exit strategy, back to that one more time. Hopefully I, I, something comes to mind. But right now it's just, you know, throw some more wood on the fire and make the freight train go a little bit faster and take it into the tracks and see what happens. <laughs> but um, that usually ends badly. <laughs> Is it the competition aspect for you? Like, do you need to compete in it? You can't just be, you can't just like want to stay kind of strong, but you have to compete? Thank you, you nailed it. I, I have to compete. Like right now, I'm really jonesing to, to get my training in high gear and get back on the platform and, and put some numbers together. Because again, you're not a bodybuilder, 
You are not a bodybuilder until you get on stage and do those quarter turns wearing your little Speedo. And you're not a powerlifter until you get out there on a platform and squat, bench press, and deadlift in total. And that's what I do. And guys always say, guys, you know, hey, what do you total? Not what do you squat, what do you bench, what do you deadlift? But what do you total? And when did you do it? Oh, back in 1997? Tell that story walking. Oh, last week or last month. Oh, that's kick ass. He just did that. Yeah. He's not just talking about it. He just did it. Didn't Ric Flair walk up to you and give you some numbers? <laughs> <laughs> Ric Flair. Well, Ric Flair, he punched me one time, but he wouldn't give me any numbers. Um, Ric Flair and I got in a fight back in 1981 <laughs> at, a, at a waffle. Um, it was, I think it was a Waffle House in Winston State of North Carolina. We got in a real fist fight. Oh, shit. But uh, he was just yelling at We yelled at him first. And, um, that he, <laughs> what did you yell at him? Well, it was you and your buddies, right? It was me and seven friends. Winston State of North Carolina. Summer 1981. Or 1980, boy, a long time ago. He got a mullet. Uh, I did not have a mullet. But I, had a, I had a good head of hair. But I know for sure that night that Rick fought the chief Wahoo McDaniels for the strap in the Winston-Salem Coliseum. And after about midnight, we're over at the Waffle House, and a limo pulls up, and Ric Flair gets out. And back then, he was a heel. He was always a bad guy, never a good guy. And me and all my friends started yelling at him and booing him and making some hand gestures that weren't very nice. And then I remember a girl got out of the back of the limo. She was with Rick, and one of my friends, it was not me, said something to the girl, Ooh. not complimentary. Ooh. And guys, I'm here to tell you, that was like, remember that Ric Flair was like 28 years old, 6'4", <laughs> 280, whatever, and a big strong man. And I'm like a high school senior or something. And Ric Flair crossed that parking lot so fast. <laughs> and all my friends took off running. I didn't, But I didn't see him. I just happened to be a step closer to Rick than everybody else. So when they took off running, I didn't see it. <laughs> and I remember I heard Steve Peterson yell, run, Tom, run. <laughs> I heard his voice, run, Tom, run. And I turned and everyone was gone. But Rick was like, from, from me to you, Mark. He was right there on me. And he reached out to grab me, and all I wanted to do was disengage. I wasn't trying to fight Ric Flair. I just wanted to get away and run. So I did the little twist the roo and the little back spin, <laughs> and he grabbed me on the shirt, and I heard this big punch go whoosh over the top of my head. It just, it just brushed the top of my head. And then I, I did a little spin and dropped down, and I broke free of his grip and took off. And I ran the 40-yard dash in about three seconds. <laughs> <laughs> And we, when I turned around, me and all my friends, we were all huffing and puffing. I was scared. I was scared shitless. I turned around, and Ric Flair and his limo driver and the girl were laughing so hard because because one man chased off eight of us or seven of them, they were. So um, it was it wasn't much of a fight really. And then years later, of course, Ric Flair became a Gold's Gym um, owner. He owned yeah, several Gold's yeah, Gyms. Absolutely. So we would see Rick every year at the Gold's Gym conventions in Las Vegas. And he was there one year, and I told him that story. I said, Rick, do you remember when you got in a fight with me at the Waffle House? And he goes, Tom, what the hell are you talking about? So I told him the story like that. And Rick's listening, and he's nodding his head, and he's smiling, and he's laughing. And he goes, Tom, I'd love to tell you I remember that fight. But remember, back then, I was a bad guy. And no matter where I went, I was always getting in fights. I couldn't go to Piggly Wiggly without getting in a fist fight with somebody's mom. <laughs> <laughs> so he goes, Tom, I don't believe, I don't, I don't remember the story, but I completely believe you. I'm not going to call you a liar. Did I hurt you? And I said, no, Rick, you, just, you threw a punch and I ducked out of it and I took off. And that was pretty much it. He goes, good, I'm glad you're okay. Are we friends now? And I gave him a big hug and I said, yeah, we're friends. You're Rick Flair. That's awesome. Those wrestlers were uh, not to be messed with back then. I remember um, we used to go to the Mid-Hudson Civic Center every month and they used to tape wrestling and they would tape like all four episodes for the whole month. So you'd get to see like four hours straight of wrestling. Oh, that's cool. And we went there one time. We'd always have like, my dad would bring us and our friends and, you know, Smelly be with us. We'd drag him along. He was a younger brother. But I remember one day, uh, Frank Mock, who was one of my brother's crazy friends, he's eaten his own poop. He's also done deadlifts naked on Christmas Day outside of uh, Mid-Hudson Bible. I've done that. The first part, no. Just one of these yes. crazy guys got in a, like such an argument with one of the moon dogs that the moon dog just straight up whacked him with that bone. Remember the moon dogs? They had the crazy hair. Yeah, I'm thinking of Hacksaw Jim Dugan right now with a two by four <laughs> instead of a bone. Do you remember but, that, uh, Frank Mock got smashed with a uh, yeah. with a bone. Um, also, my Good. friend. I hope he it sounds like he deserved it. My friend Riley, his grandfather started yelling at Baron von Raschke. Remember him, the I, claw, and he ran into early claw. He ran into the ring, and Baron von Raschke hit my friend's grandfather with a chair, and it was legit for real. Oh, there's the moon dogs. That's even better. <laughs> Oh, wow, you know what? Look, they look like powerlifters. Boy, they're, look, they're good-looking fellas. Moondog um, Rex and Moondog Spot. Yeah, that's them. 
You know what? They look, they look, they, and they kind of look like Jim Dugan, too, don't they? That's uh, what the Sullivan look. brothers are aspiring to be right now. <laughs> I'm not sure what we have right there. He's got, like, the same hair as Duffin there on the left. Yeah. That's like it's Duffin's kind of hair. A good, it's kind of a current, oh, cool man. look right there. I like that look. And the guy on the right seems discontent. Look, what's he mad about? <laughs> seems discontent. And what the hell? That's a great picture. Yeah. Dogs, yeah. Well, so he smashed him with that bone right on the head. And, like, they didn't even care. Back then, it was like, I mean, this is <laughs> no w- lawsuit. No, the cops didn't show up. It's WWE. I mean, nobody cared. We were laughing on a, at it on the way home. Oh, now it'd be on TV and it'd be a lawsuit. And it'd, oh, it'd be huge, yeah. And if you hit, a, if you hit anybody other than a person of the exact same, like a white guy, there'd be a racial thing to it. It'd be horrible. It'd be terrible right now. But uh, that's, just, that's just good fun. Yeah. And if you go in the ring, if you go in the ring during a professional wrestling match, like going under the ice the hockey game, killed. whatever happens. Happens, you kind of invited it, Tom. Has anything so, has, like you've you've seen so much when it comes to bodybuilding and powerlifting? You've been doing it yourself for a long time. You've been around a lot of other great lifters. Has anything changed in the fitness industry that is like monumental or revolutionary? Or have you seen anything like new, like new or different? Is there some machine that changed everything? Is there, you know, supplements changed everything, or some diet protocol, or has it been fairly similar to the information you learned? You know, when you in the eighties, Chris, you can almost answer this question as as completely as I can. Now. Hip thrusts that change uh, everything. I, you're, you're, I swear to God, <laughs> that's the only thing I know that's changed. Building some glutes. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't going to say hip thrust. I was going to say hip circle. That's what I was going to say. There you go. But um, brother, fellas, no, nothing. There wasn't a day we looked up and things that, that changed the whole game. No, no. Basics, right? Just the basics. I mean, right now during this current unusual situation we're in the whole world is i guess um you know the popular of the peloton bicycle and training at home and having an online coach online coaching is pretty big of course before there was an online to be online we didn't know what that was but a lot of guys had coaches even in the early 80s winning bodybuilders had prep guys i go like dude you just won the nationals who's gonna prep you and he goes well i don't know it all oh cool and then usually their prep guy would be a guy who hadn't competed in years but he, he 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 knew Everything from back then and the new stuff. So you guys are good. But to your question, there's not a there wasn't an epiphany. Nothing. Nothing. I, nothing I do bo- think that is a good point, though. Training at home has taught a lot of people how to do more at home and how to how to sort of make do with less and not necessarily need a gym. So I do think that that's probably one of the most recent changes. Yeah, I've been really. Huge. I've thought about this quite a bit, but I do think there is one giant change in the industry, and I think it's social media. Yeah. Because of social media, you now see. You know, we were talking earlier about Jesse Norris. So some kid who weighs 160 yeah. pounds thinking he's never going to lift anything mm-hmm. sees Jesse Norris at 198 deadlift 826 pounds, and he's like. Ah, maybe I could, you know, I'm, I'm skinny like that guy, or you and know, he's, creates, he's jacked, but... It creates Killer Woolham or one of those guys. You know? Yeah, one of those monsters. Yeah. So I do think the internet and, and seeing, you know, but inside the gym and the protocol inside the gym, uh, the five sets of five, like five sets of five still works. Three sets of three it still sure works. Does. Three sets of ten still works. Bodybuilding methods still work. They all, they all came from a long time ago, and there hasn't really been... Unless I'm missing something, hasn't been any sort of like new protocol that has really changed anything, in my opinion. Internet big influence, absolutely right. And of course, the, the fun part of social media—if you did—if if your workout wasn't captured mm-hmm. and then disseminated on the internet, it never happened. Never so happened. you can't claim you train legs today unless you show me that video. If I see the video, I gotta acknowledge you did something. Um, lately, we've been training at an Olympic Iron, and I won't say the name of the town. It's very close by, or East Bay, great gym. And when you walk into them, you walk in now on the hush hush through the back alley up the back staircase, and you hear the iron clanking. And in that gym, they have hundreds of the thick lipped 45s, mm. and you hear them clanking. And that sound sounds identical to the way it sounded in 1981 or 1979. It never changed. That, that, that reverberating sound of plates clanking on a bar that stays exact in the smell of the gym. It's a little icy hot, mm-hmm. uh, maybe a little testosterone or the ester they mix. It. Some these uh, smell. What is that smell in the air? Maybe it's, maybe it's DMSO. A, DMSO. That's the worst. A little balls. A, a little pro tan or <laughs> with the current tanning product of hot choice. Stuff. But gyms all smell the same, and the sounds are very similar. And they're and they're a very cool sound. We like that sound. Even your gym out here, which is kind of new, you need years to have that sound and that smell work but your gym's starting to get that smell which you may want to check into that <laughs> you may want to <laughs> Sully. <laughs> Sully. Yeah. but um i guess yeah you're right the internet changed a lot of things some for the good some for the bad i think more for good than bad and it's fun to get on there and just watch guys what big strong jack dudes and girls 
that are nobody in the in the in the tight world of powerlifting, but you know that's a big strong cat right there. Um, Olympic lifting is a great. It's, um, it's the progress of females is unbelievable. Oh, yeah, man. yep, huge. And and I give CrossFit. Mm. A lot of the credit for that. It, it, yeah. it popularized the strength sports for, for the girls. And now, well, they had a power meet last week at Old School Iron down at Vacaville. Darren Monahan was a meet sponsor. Good to have the meet back after the um, shutdown for a while. And over half the competitors were girls. Mm. And they were moving a lot of weight, big, strong girls, training hard. And it was fun. it's always fun to see. And they make great. And they are as enthusiastic as any of us ever were when we first got sport. So mm -hmm. um, it's good to see that kind of stuff happening. Yeah I, think, yeah, I think you're right about the women. I think they're proportionally, like, sometimes even stronger. Like, I see women doing squats with 315 mm -hmm. that are tiny, and I'm just going, like, oh, my God, it looks so easy. Well, it's, it's not strong for a girl anymore. You know, I think people used to say, that's pretty strong. Yeah, that's just that, straight up strong, yeah. But the weights that they're moving are stronger than a lot of guys. A lot of guys. Two Saturdays ago. Unbelievable. Olympic Iron. I went 355, five times five, second week of a prep. And the girl beside me went 335, two times five. It was a girl. And I, made, I would, she got my attention very quickly. And uh, I did not say strong weight for a girl. Like, I mean, she was almost matching my weight. And the same girl last week went heavier than all of us on the leg press. We were doing some strip sets and drop sets on the, on the Cybex leg press. We went to seven plates, pull a plate, 10 more reps, pull a plate, 10 more reps. You know the deal. She started her strip set to seven sets. Our, yeah, we started at six, she started at seven. So she's a very strong athlete, and she happens to be a girl. And she's very you ever train with a girl stronger than you? That's a, kind Ooh. of embarrassing. Um, well, I've trained with a lot of really strong girls. <laughs> Remember, I've always been about 245 pounds. Yeah. Most of my life I've been using supplements enthusiastically. So um, are the girls stronger than me? Of course there are. But yeah, I've trained with Becca Swanson, and that was embarrassing. Now, I wouldn't bench press, right? <laughs> not bench press with her. Am. I'd lose that competition yeah. real quick. But um, again, a 240 pound, five pound guy is um, can usually hold his own with most girl athletes now. But again, a lot of them out there moving big, big weight. And I wouldn't bench press with her for all the money in the world because <laughs> she's a much stronger bench presser than I. She bent 600 with a shirt. That's crazy. And who's a girl? Um, oh. Who pulled 600? Sarah. Sarah likes bacon. Oh, yeah. yeah. The, oh, yeah, yeah. Sarah, yeah. Mm -hmm. She's from uh, CSA, correct? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Combat Jessie, Sports. Yeah. yeah. I so, think trains her. I mean, that's, that's cool and calm and is and a nice, soft spoken. And she goes out there, she opens at 551, then jumps to 584. It's crazy. And I'm thinking, like, wait a minute, that's 584 on the bar. That, that's I, If I was pulling 584, I'm paying attention. Can I do it? Sure, I can do it, but I'm paying attention. Then she jumped to 606, I mm -hmm. think. And um, Same. I think she made it. Watching uh, Amanda Nunez fight this past weekend, oh. I was like, I wonder, oh, like, what kind of guys she should, she could. I mean, I know that she any any normal guy that that doesn't train that way. Like, what level could she beat? Yeah, what man? level could she beat? Like, what weight class would it represent? Could she beat like some of the guys? Like, I don't know. She's fucking unbelievable. She's powerful. Oh, it would be interesting. Tough, 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 tough. It's, it's I think really they did it in say. tennis a long time ago, but I don't know if you've yeah, ever seen really it in MMA. I think there's a small difference there because, like, I mean, Serena Williams even said herself in an interview, like, she is the top tennis player, female tennis player, but she even said she wouldn't be able to beat the top 100 guys. I think she got beat by somebody who was like 200th in the world that was a man. Because it's just absolute more force, yeah. especially the, uh, like of those guys, right? So I mean, Amanda Nunez, like she could fuck up a lot of MMA fighters, but if you look at the <laughs> MMA guys in her weight class, if it, it, like, I'm not gonna say shit, but they, it, it's, it's a diff it, it is different. There yeah, is a difference. I wonder yeah. if it Without went doubt. down a couple weight classes, if she'd be able to do anything, or if those guys would be too fast. Yeah, I, just, I just wonder, yeah. Curious. yeah. Got to put up a lot of money. Let's see it. <laughs> yeah. Too many people will get too mad, though. You know? Yeah, I think it's. Uh, I know yeah. she'd fuck me. I know. Uh, oh, she'd fuck me too. Oh yeah, yeah. You know yeah. the uh, little blonde girl, uh, Valen. Is it Valentino Shevchenkov or how? With a crew cut. So the, no, oh, yeah. the, no, not that know. one. Shevchenko. But the other. She she wants to <laughs> fight a, a man. She legitimately <laughs> says like, listen, I'll fight anybody. I don't care about you know the consequences of it. Like I I just want to get in there. She feels it's safe. But too many people get too upset about it, I think. Those girls have chosen violence as a way of life. <laughs> That's what they've chosen. So they're, they, they are cut from a different type of cloth than any of the four of us. See, I know you like your BJJ and you like yeah. MMA. We all love MMA. Uh -huh. But we didn't choose to be fighters for a living. We yeah. don't depend on our fight checks to pay the rent. And those people, those girls have chosen violence as a way of life. And um, there's, there's something else altogether. If, they, if she wants to fight a guy, 
more power to her. Yeah. Will the, will the fans pay to watch that on pay-per-view? Oh, yeah. Hell yeah, they'll pay to watch yeah. that. I, I think they'll pay to watch yeah. Mayweather fight um, uh, uh, Logan Connor. Paul. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Craziness. So, a girl versus guy really fighting for real. But I, I think the guy may be... He that would may, be fucked up for the dude, man. He's, he's, in, a, he's, he's in a tough spot. <laughs> yeah. He's in a tough, lose. tough spot. The ice is... The, anyway, he walks, the ice is dangerously thin. If he loses, the girl knocked you out. Yeah. If he I wins... Know. You choked out a girl, yeah. motherfucker. I mean, I mean, if they weigh the same, he's. Uh, what did you think of the Tyson fight? Did you watch that, Tyson Roy Jones? Unfortunately, I was. Um, I had to do some uh, dishes. That no, I didn't watch that. No, no, no. Oh, you didn't watch it? Yeah, I did watch it. Yes. No, I, 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 was, I was like, the sarcasm is too far. Here. I was not going to watch the right type. It was like a square dance, and I didn't. I heard Tyson won, but then it was a draw. It was kind of bad. I thought. Kind. They got the word kind of. It was yeah. bad. It yeah. was cool seeing Tyson move that it, way. Tyson it, still had some. It was so cool. Tyson would be cool for the rest of our lives. It was definitely like I wanted to see it for sure, and you wanted to see that. Yeah, I just wanted to. You gotta I, be ashamed. I, well, of yourself. we love Mike Tyson. We grew up with him. <laughs> we love Tyson. He's yeah. the coolest. So we were like, yeah, you know, who cares? I, I just want to see it. But I was kind of disappointed that he didn't go in there. You know, it wasn't. Hey, if Ed Cohen was going to do the powerlifting meet, I'd I'd watch it. You know, it doesn't yeah. matter if the guy's I would go retired. Cheer him or, on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But um, so now, unfortunately, you know, fighters so, won't stop fighting. But now he wants to fight Holyfield, and I think that's dangerous because he lost. Wait, well, who? Holyfield wants to fight Tyson. Holyfield challenged no, him. No, 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 but no. But Holyfield's no. already beat him twice. I don't think that's a good. But Holyfield was so cool back in the day when when Lee Haney, Mister Olympia, seven times, um, when Lee Haney did Holyfield's strength training program. Lee and I were friends back then, or I saw him quite often. And Holyfield was just the coolest, easy going. He's like, this guy's a fighter. He didn't have a. This guy, but in the ring. Oh my, not to be, no, yeah, well, obviously. Yeah. Is that a little suspicious that Lee Haney was doing the uh, program there? Well, Lee knows strength training. Um, Holyfield gained some solid body weight, but it's, it's combat sports. What do you, I don't want combat sports guys that are, they're vegans. I want my, I, I want my combat sports guys gassed up, eating lots of, well, that's what I'm saying. Do you think he was gassed up? I want my up? combat sports guys eating lots of carnivore-based stuff, all the, all, all the big stuff, and hitting hard. I don't uh, know how they're talking about who, how they're going to fight. And if you say that again, I'm going to punch you. No, real fighters don't say anything. I guess they what I meant. knock your teeth out. What are you saying again? I do oh, think man. he was on the juice. <laughs> what? Do you think Holyfield was on the, on the gas? I sure hope so. I, I sure hope so. There you go. If oh, I'm wrong, man. I'll be mad for the rest of my life but i'm not wrong yeah no during the uh i think the the balco thing his his address came up as yeah. one of the guys who, <laughs> he, but it was like way after i was, I was in the yeah. balco address book who was a really expensive the really expensive third baseman for the yankees mm. not jeter um oh, hey rod yeah. hey rod remember he got popped it's for a, a while there oh. and he had lots of doctors phone numbers and all sorts of body but i was going please have tom file in your book the same my name on tv <laughs> like, hey rod if it's a rod calls you you probably know something about peds <laughs> But he was exonerated of all that, so that never happened. Did you right see there. that movie they did about him, Screwball? <laughs> that was great. Yeah, they did a documentary about A Rod and his whole steroid thing, and the guy that did I cocaine. I didn't see that either. It's really good. Yeah, That's the, a, it's the on The Netflix. guy that it's did great. Cocaine Cowboys did it, which he's a great director, and it's really good. It's a fun. It's a fun movie. He used little kids to play <laughs> A Rod and the different because because the story is so goofy. It's wild. That sounds good. The story is so like ridiculous that he just used little kids to show how like ridiculous it was. But you should check out Screwball I, and people listening. Is he telling too. the truth? You're not. You're not just fucking. No, no, right it's now. a really cool movie. I gotta check that out. Yeah. Did you see Cocaine Cowboys? It sounds familiar. Well, you need to see that too, then, if you haven't seen it. I'll take a look at that too. A lot of good documentaries out there. I have Netflix. I got it last month. There you go. I didn't. I heard about. It. I just never had. Did it. Did you watch but... the Night Stalker documentary? <laughs> Richard Ramirez. Yeah, he was a spooky bastard. Yeah, it's Holy crazy. Shit. But the guy that did that documentary, the guy that did that documentary, is like a hero of mine. He's a documentary filmmaker named Tiller Russell, and he's got about like six or seven documentaries. They're all awesome. So he did a movie called Operation Odessa. It's all underground. That's crazy on Netflix. stories. I always see that one on Netflix. Operation Odessa is about like these guys that sell a, sub, a Russian submarine to the, these other guys. So all of his stories Ooh. are really pretty wild and and really interesting. He did uh, the last narc. <laughs> the last narc is on um, Amazon, and that's like a four part series. I've been looking for a broker a nuclear submarine. If you know anybody, give I was going to say if I need watch, a Russian submarine, I'd contact Tom Pyle. <laughs> you got to watch this movie because a guy who sells the submarine, he's a jacked Russian named Tarzan. That's all you oh, need to wow. know. Makes perfect sense. Yeah, it's like something in the typhoon class where the nuclear capabilities would be nice. <laughs> yeah, used but not too old. Mm -hmm. get, get back to me on that one. Some modern technology. Get submarines, oh, what a crazy go. invention. We got like a. Uh, we got? Who's that guy? I Where's think the Jack Russian? Uh, 
I don't see a Jack Russian anywhere. He's in here somewhere. Hmm. <laughs> that might be him. That could be bigger. him. No, let me see. Interesting. Oh, okay. this is the... Uh, hey, we know who that is. No, this, is a, this is Odessa or whatever. Oh, okay, called. okay. They really sold a submarine to drug dealers. Or, Didn't you say you worked for some yeah. Showtime for a period of time? Absolutely, yes. I was. Most Showtime people, they had a huge in-house contingency as well, but they have a lot of freelance guys. I worked freelance for Showtime Sports for many years, and we televised combat sports. I visited you when you were doing that. You yeah, were, yeah, yeah. We were down in Fresno, I believe. He was, I got you some seats. Yeah, he was the guy that would bring the fighters out to the ring. It was really cool. A oh, really wow. cool gig. A whole lot stage of Stage manager, is that what that's called? Correct. Stage manager, first AD, different different, different companies were called the same job by different titles, but a whole lot of fun. And liking the sport of MMA, I mean, I would have worked for free. They didn't pay me much anyway, but I would have worked for free to have ringside seats and talk to the guys and hang out with all the champions back then. And remember back then, Strike Force had a lot of really good world champions, a lot of a lot of great fighters, especially the heavyweights. Unfortunately, in 2000, Strike Force was really good. Strike Force was kick ass. Yeah, and the heavyweights, especially, were phenomenal. Mm -hmm. UFC always wanted to buy just the heavyweight division, all the fighters. Scott Coker wouldn't sell them evidently. And so UFC pulled the trigger and bought the entire thing. Remember, 2008, 2009, Maybe, perhaps? Yeah. And Strike Force went away, sadly, for a lot of fighters, and sadly for um, Showtime Sports and the entire production crew. I was one of them because our, our jobs. But that's where, like, Ronda Rousey came from, right? Oh, yeah. From yeah, yeah. Without and, a doubt. Yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of really good people. I heard about her. She came up. She won her first two fights convincingly. Um, she had a lot of intangibles. Good on the mic. Good looking girl. Always finished her fights. Guys want to see fights finish. So uh, we knew Ronda was going to be something special early on. We didn't predict what she became. We never mm -hmm. saw that coming. But um, funny on that note, when she fought Holly Holmes at MGM Grand Garden, I was in the sports book with Javier Mendez. You guys know Javier. Javier owns AKA. Javier, in MMA, in the UFC, when a guy's in the ring getting the strap put around his waist, the guy behind him is normally Javier Mendez. Hmm. Trains a lot of real world champions. Nice, nice guy. He goes, Tom, Javier will make a gamble from time to time. He'll make, a, he'll make a bet. He likes the casinos, like I do. And he goes, Tom, Holly Holmes, 14 to 1, $1,000. I said, what are you talking about? Against Ronda? I wouldn't bet 50. What? No way. I'm get shut up. And I ignored him, brushed him off. He goes, okay, I'm telling you. Well, about six hours later, and then the, knee, the kick to the head, mm. and $1,000 would have been $14,000. Man, wow. But I uh, <clears throat> bet it on somebody else somewhere else. And, um, but he, he said, Holly Holmes to win that fight. And uh, she knocked out Ronda. And after that, Ronda fought. She was gone for about a year and a half, then came back and fought maybe Amanda? Or maybe... Um, no, it wasn't Amanda. I forgot who it was. Anyway, after that, she was never the same. Yep. But um, yeah, Ronda, got her, she cut her chops with strike force and she was um hell of an athlete the you know, tv loved her the fans loved her and i think she's now wwe right she impressed she was and then she left and that um she i believe she's pregnant now oh. uh, having a baby didn't uh, know maybe had a baby maybe i don't know so she's uh, I, I but then the fans kind of turned on her I, oh. thought, I thought she was excellent in wrestling i thought she was really cut out for it and did really good but the fans kind of got mad that she got pregnant and left. But, I mean, that's just life. You know what I mean? It's like... Oh, so they were really mad at her? For real mad? They, oh. she, she talked some shit a little bit, too, I guess. There, yeah, there was you some, want a baby? Who are you? Some sort of controversy around it where she said the hey, fans... You want real life? She said something where, like... I don't think the fans appreciated me anyway, and then they got, they sort of retaliated on well, her. When she says and that, she has to know they're going to say, yeah, well, in that case... In a way, I think she was kind of right, though. I oh. think the fans weren't supporting her in a way that they maybe should have. Now, the next big it. thing, the big MM, next big MMA, WWE dynamic, it has to be Conor McGregor showing up as a manager, because mm. he, hopefully he's through with combat sports. He lost badly to um, help Dustin Portas. Yeah, Poirier. Poirier. Yeah, he didn't lose badly. He got he got beat up a little bit. And um, I'd love to see him make the transition over to WWE. Obviously, his gift for Gab is... Uh, yeah, he'd be is, awesome in acting. as good as anybody. He'd be awesome it's, in wrestling. As as, it'd be, he'd be phenomenal. Yeah. He's a little bit small to get in the ring and fight some of those guys. Mm -hmm. He could go up to 190, perhaps, and be, he'd be a little more intimidating physically. But some of the pro wrestlers are really, really big boys. And it doesn't make sense sometimes when we see the really small guys getting a beating the guys that are twice their size. Like, wait a minute, that's, that's not going to happen that yeah. way. In real life, it could happen that way. But in pro wrestling... That's not the way it works out. But I'd love to see Connor in the ring. It looks like he wants to fight again against Dustin. Oh. 
Which, I think that'd be awesome. I think that's going to be a great film. No, it wouldn't be why awesome. Why wouldn't it be no. awesome? Tell me why. Why? Dude, well, what, what, if he wins, <laughs> he's, he, he, he's got to come back. He's, he's, one, he's one in a row. If okay. he loses, now he's like 0-4. Oh uh, then, he, then he's out. But, then, but at least they get to do those three fights. Because of his his phenomenal record and what he brought to the sport, it's his choice. If he wants to fight again, let him fight again. And why pay to watch it? I probably will. Yeah. If not, I'll go to Bell's house and watch it on him. Or we'll pirate the video signal somewhere. But... Uh, <laughs> No, we wouldn't do that. Um, I'd watch that again, but I hopefully, hopefully he makes the transition to something a little less dangerous because he doesn't need to get punched in the face by real fighters. Yeah, he's got money now. <laughs> he's got a lot of money, money, and he's a good-looking guy. And yeah. I hear Proper 12. Uh, he just sold it. He he's did. a what? Well, so he didn't sell it. He never really actually owned it. Like what Proper 12 was when a lot of these celebrities do is like somebody will come to you and be like, I have an awesome product. I want you to be the face of it. Mm. And so they he, they basically, him and his manager, had, you know, they wanted to make a liquor and they found a partner and they, they all partnered up. And so that the the actual company that owns Jose Cuervo actually owns, owned like, I think like 40% of that. Mm. And then now they own, they just bought the other 51% and they said Connor will probably stay on as the face of the brand, but not necessarily, not he's not the owner anymore. But that made over a billion dollars in a couple, you know, in the first year. I've seen some lists where it was legit. It was a legit boot product that sold really well, and his cut of the action was substantial. Yeah, no, he's going to make a lot of money off of it. I'm saying it's like he uh, he's already out of it, but that's what you do with those businesses. <laughs> Who was it that he fought? And after he fought, he knocked some guy out, and then he started to apologize to the masses on rate on camp. Joe Rogan was holding the mic, and he grabbed the mic from Rogan. He goes, "I'd like to sincerely apologize to absolutely nobody." <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's when he won the title. Oh, yeah. When he said that, I went, "That's it. He's done. He can do whatever he wants to. He yeah. can be the president. He can. He can. He can kick McMahon out of wrestling. He can be. He can be the Rock. He can be Tom Brady. He can do. He killed your Tom Brady Faber when they were on the uh, Ultimate Fighter. He called him a fifty-year-old washed-up skateboarder. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. that's perfect. And you look at totally cool. You go, your yeah. is totally cool. But you look at him and go, he's kind of right. Like yeah. that was awesome. Yeah. That was an awesome dig. You know, and, and, uh, not UFC. Um, WCW. What, what was it? Uh, Uriah Faber fought for um, WEC. WEC, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. He was their world champion many years. And they were kind of a feeder league to UFC, but they were better than a feeder league. They were really good. Remember, there was a while there when Uriah, well, he was the wrecking machine. Mm -hmm. like, he, 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 he go through everybody like, this guy can't be beat. He's crazy good. Mm -hmm. yeah, the UFC didn't have that weight class, I don't think. Ah, uh, I don't know. I, I don't recall that. But no, when, they didn't. Hey, when Uriah was on. Was on Boy, oh boy, that was something special right there. The girls loved him. But I see the 50-year-old uh, skateboard thing perfectly. Yeah. He's yeah. interesting, though, because he still does fights here and there. I would have thought that he'd be totally out of it. Yeah, but just he just won recently. Like yeah, yeah, I don't think he lost yeah. after that. I'm not sure. I think he, he had a one, one, lost one, something like that. I think his recently. most recent one, he got beat. Yeah, he yeah. did. Yeah. He did. But right before but that, still he won. Fighting. Before that, he, yeah, was... He was he won dominantly, but yeah, he never won a title in the once the W, once the UFC was bought out or sorry, wow, once the UFC bought WEC and he came over, they opened up that weight class, the one thirty five or they think so, and that's when he started competing. But he never won a title. That was uh, his first fight was against uh, Jose Aldo, and he oh. fucked him up. That was remember such a him leg fight. kicks. Yeah, that was, Boy, that kicks. was a wrecking machine. Like, what do you do with it? But then. You know who went right through? Yeah, mm. oh, McGregor. <laughs> right. Remember that? They called it too. I, I never. I didn't see that coming at all. Like he, this guy's maybe he's a little bit past his prime, but McGregor mm. needs to be extra, extra careful. And um, he didn't need to be anything. He just knocked him right out, and that was the end of that. How do you feel about the use of uh, PEDs in the sport and like being so widespread? And like, what do you? How do you feel about that stuff? Maybe it all sweetheart for for for, for combat sports. <laughs> they're, they're they're what you use. I mean, they're they're made for power. They're made for combat sports guys. I mean, they weren't yeah. made for them. They're made for guys who have much worse trauma, getting car crashes, and can't eat or drink food, and need to recover. But um, they're they're ideal for combat sports guys, guys who play hockey, guys who play in the NFL, guys who need aggression and physical strength and need to be able to take it. So in your mind, guys like uh, say Bones Jones, he's gotten in trouble for some things, and it's, oh, it's maybe little levels that you, that doesn't bother you at all. It doesn't. Once again, do we want to see our do we want to see vegans out there using harsh language? I don't. Or do we want? He, you know, <laughs> well, that's two of us. That's, two of us do not want to see that. I think, you know, they could have a vegan fight league. Hey, hey, wait a minute now. Let's think about that. Something to, something to talk about. Um, vegan fight no, it's league. Nothing, it's nothing to talk about. Um, I want to see guys that are aggressive, and, and now they can dish it out because we can still dish it out. We just can't take it anymore. If I get punched in the mouth, that's it. I quit. If I fall down, I might get back up but you want to see guys that can take it and anabolic steroids or peds all peds or anabolic steroids allow you to dish it out and take it as well and that's what we want to see in every single sport 
combat sports especially. Mm. So um, all the drug testing for, for the level playing field, well, that's fine if you want to test them. But I want my guys mm-hmm. on a little bit of gas, and hopefully they still do that. <laughs> um, that's, again, everyone's choice. That, I mean, all the fighters especially, if they get popped, they pay the penalty. And they know the penalty going in if they want to cross that line. They know what's going to happen. So um, everyone knows and they take their chances. You know, they roll the dice, they take their chances. Maybe they could figure out a way to regulate some of those things. Like, okay, like maybe let the fighters take this. Well, now they've kind of right? done that. Now, you know, they have? What? Well, 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 certainly with testosterone, they want your levels to be within a certain range. They give mm-hmm. you a range. It could be a little bit high. But with your low, if you take... Though, is it? Pardon me? Is that in the UFC? Uh, in all, I think in all combat, in all sports now, really? they give you a range. Like, if they need to take any testosterone, because you have a certain natural free yeah. serum testosterone, but they give it a range, and it can't be out of that range. And surprisingly, most good guys, their numbers are right at the top of the range. Mm. How'd that happen? <laughs> well, they're kind of they're doing the blood work, and they're watching, looking at panels. So, so they, are you saying if there's a guy that's below the set range, he can take testosterone yeah. to get into the range? That's legal for somebody in combat sports? But you just can't tell anybody that you're doing it. <laughs> huh. right. So they used to do okay. that back in um, at UCLA, Don Catlin, who runs all the testing. Yeah. Um, actually, it wasn't Don Catlin. It was um, the coach from Santa Monica College. Uh, I want to say his name is something Douglas, Coach Douglas. He, we, we went and visited this guy, and he was really old. Mm-hmm. And he accidentally told us, like, oh, you guys talk to Don Catlin? Yeah, he's great. <laughs> we used to go there to make sure all of our levels were in the right range. I love it. This and is cool for you to say. Like, I love it. He, this guy was like <laughs> That's 80, not his real name, though. Okay. He was 80-something okay. years old, right? And he's like, yeah, we used to go there and, and make sure our levels That's were in the right range. That's cool. I'm like, what levels? You're like, you know the testosterone and the estrogen and stuff? Like, I don't really know. I'm not a scientist, yeah. but we'd make sure that they weren't over the range that they, that they should, you know, get. And this is... Carl Lewis's coach, and this mm-hmm. is all these people. Oh, yeah. That, you know, so yeah. I can't say definitively that I know and I have conclusive evidence, but basically it leaked from the, al- the mouth of an old guy. And then we tried to go back and interview him on camera, and he was, he was on to us. He was like, I can't actually talk about that anymore. So was he? We did, never got him. Did the IOC? And now he's not here anymore. He's not. He's he was really old. He coached know. a lot of world champions. I think this is who I, I'm thinking about. I think at the end, unfortunately, the IOC banned him for life. More than once. Who? The, the, the <laughs> man you're talking about. Oh, no, that was, um, wasn't that Trevor Graham? That was a guy that got caught with. Um, he, it was a goal stream all the time, and he got banned for life. And he got that back down to two years, then six months. Then it happened again. And I think finally, when they said life, they meant, son, don't come back anymore. <laughs> you're, high, you're gone. Yeah. But I'm um, not sure who that was. It does happen. And for every team of guys coming to, come together to, to design the drug test as a team of doctors, trying to beat the drug test. There's always a sacrificial lamb, too. Like, there's a guy that's maybe not that good that gets busted. You gotta so have that, that guy out there, sure. <laughs> so that everybody else can, uh, you know, run Carry free. On. Yeah, yeah, do, yeah. Do they do that? Do they, uh, I don't know, like, we'll just say Conor McGregor gets popped. And like, fuck. And then they'll find somebody else down the ranks and be like, nope, that's the guy. He's gonna be our poster boy for getting people you know, in trouble. <sighs> I, I can't. I cannot imagine Connor ever failing no, a drug I, test was just, for anybody. That sure. was just an example, but just insert uh, anybody top ranked fighter. I think that would definitely make some damn sense. Like if your top fighter gets popped and he's making y'all hella money, like are you gonna really? Yeah, you gonna try to cover yeah. that shit. <laughs> like in the NFL, you don't want your you don't want your thoroughbreds on the oh, sideline. You, 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 you want your guys on the field making spectacular plays. The so NFL, it's very rare for it to be a top-level guy. Yeah, and again, to, to, to really know the answer, boy, you've got to be an elite person right. traveling in rarefied so, yeah. air. We're, none of us are ever going to be in that meeting where they decide, here's what we're going to do, boys. Yeah. That's a very tough meeting to get into. <laughs> and we ain't, with, even with all your money, you're not going to that meeting. You may serve them some drinks in the lobby, but you're not going to you're, you're not getting into that meeting. I can't get in the parking lot. Get out of here, file. Get out of the get. And you know, I'm doing a documentary. Not today, you're not. <laughs> they uh-huh. Oh your camera and smash it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but does it make sense? Like, yeah, it makes a whole lot of sense. It sure does. Nice little conspiracy theories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, some of these drugs like EPO, they're really hard uh, oh. to detect, right? And so it's you get somebody drug. like... Beautiful drug. Somebody who's a great fighter. <laughs> tell, like, tell me about like Donald Trump. Beautiful drug. Beautiful drug. <laughs> oh, like, Is that something that cyclists what? use? Yeah, yeah. yeah. cyclists. But it. It's yeah. what TJ, TJ Dillashaw <laughs> oh. also got caught oh, with. Okay. Stop, yeah. stop, stop. You sound like you're having an orgasm over here. Bro. What's going on? EPO. Is that great? <laughs> Erythropyotene. What an amazing drug that saves a lot of lives. For a couple of years, there was the single most expensive drug in the world. Nothing more wow. expensive than that. Nothing. Um, and it, it, it would save your life if you needed it. Ooh. But an amazing drug that increased our BC red blood cell count. 
Uh, unfortunately, when you when you have too many red blood cells in your blood, the viscosity goes way, way up. Back in the early 90s, when synthetic EPO first hit them, when they first synthesized it, your body produces it naturally. Mm -hmm. When they first synthesized it, a lot of Dutch cyclists, cyclists got a hold of it, but they didn't know how to dose it. And they lost some cyclists. They lost some guys Ooh, right before they died. Too thick, right? And they their died. blood was the viscosity of room temperature honey, huh. just like room temperature honey. Sick. Yeah. Oh. Imagine trying to pump that through <laughs> your veins. Sounds painful. Oh yeah. But hey, when they, but when they, before they died, they were a wrecking machine on the mountains. I mean, they they never burned glycogen for fuel. They always had oxygenated blood being shoved, shoveled into their muscles, and they were like they were just ferocious. Like, where's he going? How could he go that fast? And then he was the faster. <laughs> and then one of his teammates who was on more gas would past that and you're like how can this be happening and that's what they were doing remember if you don't burn glycogen you don't have any lactic acid and with no lactic acid disguise on how fast you can go what can your heart take your heart's indestructible you never blow up your heart you can't do it you can so, try but you're not going to do it but EPA was an amazing and what, drug and what, what i was saying before that is that there's a test that can actually identify epo and i actually interviewed the guy that that did the test and he told me that when he brought the test to the United States, like the, you know, USADA, mm. that they said, we can't use your test because it'll put us at a disadvantage on the international playing field, meaning that your <laughs> test actually works. Our guys will get busted, but the other countries, your test the works. other countries will be using this substandard test that mm -hmm. we can pass. So we're going to stick with this test over here. And he was just like really disappointed. He actually has a letter from the USADA oh. saying like, hey, you know, your, it's your test would put us at a disadvantage. It's crazy. Here's the thing when they made, I don't know how the, the powers that be spoke to the pharmaceutical manufacturers. A buddy of mine was a, was a rep, not a rep, he was, he was a shot caller with Amgen. Amgen makes Procrit. Procrit is a trade name for EPO. Yeah. And he said, look, they asked us to put a genetic marker in the drug. Our bodies produce EPO naturally. So you, you test positive, all of us would test positive EPO. Mine would be extremely, like one. I don't know what the numbers are. Two. I wouldn't have much. Um, you'd have a little more than me. You'd have more than him. But they convinced the, mark, the manufacturers to put a genetic marker in there. So if you have any synthetic EPO, there's a fingerprint or a metabolite mm. that says, oh, hey, by the way, manufactured by XYZ Pharmaceutical House, you're busted. So now they have a real problem with it. And the guys know you can't take this brand, this brand, this brand, or this brand because it has a marker and they will see it. Now, they didn't, they, the Pharmaceutical House didn't do that to appease USADA or WADA. Who's got owns USADA? Who's that? Travis Teagarden. Yeah. That guy, whatever. Um, they didn't do it for him. They did it to other doctors and other medical people say, hey, this guy already has synthetic EPO. We can't give him any more. Or the source of this EPO that he does have is, you, in fact, you know, it's, uh, synthetic. Really, it sense. really interesting. What? One of the biggest sponsors for the sport of cycling is... Hold it. Hold it. Budweiser. Amgen Pharmaceuticals that makes EPO. Then, yes, <laughs> the tour of California. I love that connection. Isn't I always love that connection. Isn't that hilarious? It's, it's, it's so phenomenal. you see all these people like riding around. They got Amgen, and it's got like like their logo is like blood, like these <laughs> bubbles of blood or whatever. And so it's, it's a, a hemoglobin. Yeah, hemo yeah, exactly. And so, I asked my boys. I said, "Hey, any chance? What's the chance of sneaking some of that program out the back door?" And he goes, <laughs> "Rob Fort Knox, you got a better chance." I said, "What do you mean? He goes, do you want to cost for this stuff? Like you know, thirty mLs or however it goes." This much Procrit was worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. He goes, no, I can't steal any Procrit for you. I said, I didn't ask you to steal I, it. I just wanted you to get some for me. I would be really interested <laughs> to see. <laughs> same shit. Yeah, same thing. What? I would be really interesting to see what that does like for a lifter. Because obviously you have more endurance. So coming in and doing the same weights. I would say strongman guys probably use it. They yeah, love it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Strong man competitors have they to gotta be careful with their, yeah. with their blood, obviously. But Boy, they've got to be careful. And they're already at the you know, fine pounds, line. Yeah. Between, yeah. But, um, and uh, Lance Armstrong, he used to take his own like his own blood out of his system when he was at yeah, the highest blood. altitude, training the hardest, right? And then he would put it back into his system, right? Exactly. I mean, right. It wasn't it just him. It, was it worked beautifully. It worked beautifully. Very, very and safe. And so there's levels to it, right? Like um, there's the level where you can uh, do altitude. You right. can simulate altitude in like a chamber. You can in, um, do blood doping where you pull your own blood out and then inject it back in, and then you can do EPO, which is Armstrong the Lie is an amazing movie. Yeah, it's and amazing. Armstrong, I think, did all of them. He did all of them. He was he was a record machine, and everybody else in the top ten, anyone on the podium, did exactly the same thing. Once again, do I want to watch guys pedal their bikes really slowly up the side of the mountain, zigzagging and wobbling? And no, I want to see guys raging. And when this guy can't take any more, this guy passes them, mm -hmm. and then this guy shows up and passes them. And what do they do? 
they chase them down. And Seema, to your point about like regulation, so years ago in swimming, they had they had a swimsuit that just I remember the, that the, suit. the record started getting smashed yeah, yeah, right yeah, yeah. away. Mm-hmm. So swimming, you know, they, they they pulled that out. They they got rid of that the shark suit or something. They, they, they made it illegal. It, you know, but it's like, well, what's the point of swimming? Like, what's the point of competitive swimming? We're trying to see people swim as fast as possible. Uh, and and maybe there are certain suits now that enhance your speed. Uh, but people were like, no, 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 this is too fast. You know, so where do you kind of draw that line sometimes? Nike created a shoe a while back where people were smashing records as well. And I think there was some record uh, in the marathon that was beat. And it was, they haven't seen a progress leap like that since like the 1950s. Like it was just from you know, a shoe? Yeah, from a shoe, from a I shoe propulsion. This at all. So they 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 scratched it, and there's a lot of rumors that uh, Usain Bolt utilizes it and stuff like that. But I mean, he's going to smash everybody anyway. He's but a stud. there's a lot of, uh, of uh, controversy over those kinds of shoes, and like, what do you allow? What don't you allow? I think. I mean, I, I think in track, it's like we're trying to see who can run the fastest, right? So, you know, in car racing, they're not going to have any limits on the. They're, they're, well, they're going to have some limits on the car for safety, I guess. But in the case of somebody running, like, what's the point in... As long as the shoe's available to him and me and this guy and you, more power to him, put the shoe out there. And speaking of shoes, beautiful segue. I don't know about that, Beautiful segue on the shoe thing. Thank you for the shoe donation. Mark Bell's got a... He's he's a shoe... What do you call guys who have a lot of shoes? Connoisseur. Connoisseur. Sneakerhead. 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 Thank you. An asshole. And and Brother Bell evidently buys lots of shoes, never wears them. Came into the gym last week, and out there on the gym floor, there's like there's dozens of pairs of brand new shoes that's sitting there, and I am, I'm wearing them right now. I'm wearing your shoes, Bell. So thank you very much. I love it. Another key, another example of Bell being generous for no reason at all to nobody's, which is very cool. <laughs> but um, I don't go like you having a shoe that made guys that really made them faster. They look pretty cool. Some of those guys' shoes look really cool. We can't buy them. But wait up, why don't you think that if everyone had access to it, you were you were about to say something there? What do you mean? Uh, because that's never the case. <laughs> but that, that, that that has me wondering if it was the case, because if we look at sports like track, you got all of these already elite level athletes, right? Now, if all of these elite level athletes are allowed access to the same type of whatever, shoes, drugs, etc., the guy that's at the top is going to be at the top, but the records are going to be fucking crazy still. Like, it's going to be just an even, even crazier thing, right? I want to see that. I want to see that. Guys, girls. Is that the shoe? Andrew? Yeah, so it's, Light, the, uh, life just... it's the Nike uh, Vaporfly. So I guess they... That's a track shoe? Yeah, well, I, I'm... That I'm, can you... be a competitive track. Can no, you buy so, them on eBay? No. You, so the thing is, it was banned. It was a long distance running shoe. Oh, okay. And then... Uh, it was a marathon. So they, they... But they got it approved for the 2020 Olympics. So the, if you think about if you think about it like uh it, it why it may not work well for sprinting is because the race is over so quickly mm. but if we run for a while maybe it's just giving you a little fraction tiny bit better than another shoe at that level one percent is a huge yeah. amount so but i just think that in general like life just doesn't work that way about you know you having access to this and not, me not having access to that i mean even when it comes to swimming you could get like you know some of these people might get the best coach in the world when they're 11 yeah. they might pay ten thousand dollars a month for this particular coach that other person doesn't have access we're still going to meet up the olympics and we're still going to be timed the exact same way and still judge the exact same way so i think all this i just is, don't think it's ever really even steven kind of thing you know all right. this stuff He's is right. going to go away with uh crisper have you guys heard of crisper mm. Which oh, is like, making uh, me hungry. So it's is like, that, the, over, is that uh, the chicken it's sandwich a, from McDonald's? Yeah, that's, it's that's a, after you put it in the air fryer. It <laughs> comes a, out a little crisper. It's a gene <laughs> editing tool. Uh huh. And so if there's something that you don't that like shit's about, you oh, know, you're your, like your kid, kid that you're right? gonna have, or even I think even even if you're a little bit older, you can still do it. Mm-hmm. You can just snip things out of your genetics that are causing problems, right? There's a guy that that, that is working on a lot of stuff. I saw a whole he was special on, on him, and he wiped out like seven diseases that are like really prominent in people. If you listen to Tim Ferriss' most wild. recent uh, podcast, it, it says CRISPR in the title. Mm-hmm. It's uh, It might be one or two back, but it's, it's very recent. It's really good with a scientist that's like doing all this. And he says it's very inexpensive, which is like, you know, you're talking about access. Hey, if everybody has access to it, you would think it costs like a billion dollars. Well, the machine itself is actually expensive, but the process is, isn't expensive. In the United States, I think they said we already have like 30 of these machines and that they could be being used right now. So a lot of people seem to think there was an undocumented trip of Usain Bolt, and I'm not accusing him of any, anything, but before he broke the world record, he had gone to China and a lot of people suspected that he did CRISPR because no drugs showed up in the system and he smashed a record. Mm-hmm. Could he be that fast? Possibly. I, 
I would You're like the man, though. I mean, I would like to think so. So CRISPR could be applied but, to people, for adults, not in the, uh, in, in, they, in the little we're brand new. It's not when we're little kids, or even before. I'm that. not. I'm not positive. I don't have all the facts on it, but I know CRISPR. if you listen to that podcast, it'll be on there. We got Google they that. Remind me, Google CRISPR. Yeah, they, it's, we got K or C on that. C. 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 Thank you. What about yeah. longevity? Like, does it help you live longer? Because that seems to be I think, all people I think care about. So I think that that's what it is. Is so like you'll you would edit out the genes that cause things like <laughs> life lifelong well like lifelong uh, chronic illnesses that would prop up when you're like a little kid when you're a baby. You'd get rid of those and then wow. you'd like a rash no more. Yeah. yeah. Well, just anything. Well, age age is a uh, is a problem just like anything else. Like it it's not. There's no like governing laws of of uh, of the world that prevent us from living as long as we want. We just haven't figured out how to avoid. No, no there is. How Governor to avoid Cuomo, disease. New York, takes care of that for you. Okay, <laughs> Governor Cuomo has that covered. Oh, He's got old people. <laughs> God damn, that was right. taking out a population, right? Um, oh. Do they have something that they can cure my genetic? Flaws that are kind of more like decision making, like casinos and Reno. That would be uh, psychedelics. Okay, good. Thank you very much. That's that. psychedelics. I'm not going to like that. a gambling addiction or something. Not an addiction, but an enthusiasm to make <laughs> bets over and over again. <laughs> not an addiction, just an enthusiasm. I like that. To continue to make the there, same bet repeatedly, yeah, no matter what. I think there would be. I think there would be. I think there's there's genetic coding for like a lot of these things. Get that, get that number down. Let's call them. <laughs> Let's call CRISPR and see what they see what they got going over there. Maybe we can get involved somehow. Yeah, yeah, we can be on um, the tri like yeah. the trials, clinical trials. We Count me in, sure. Yeah, why not? Right? Yeah. Did it's, you start with bodybuilding first? I mean, I'm just curious about that. Did absolutely. You start with bodybuilding well, first. Very close. Powerlifting? The Teenage Tar Heel was first bodybuilding show. Mm -hmm. Teenage Tar Heel. Aaron Baker won that show. By the way, Aaron been pretty good IFBB pro. Amazing. Smelly's wrestled him. So, uh, that he was a Wait, pro wrestler on the, on the on the hush hush <laughs> nah, nah, in, in Wait, an you wanted weird and bodybuilding kind of here we go it all comes back around apartment 213 in yeah. Santa Monica <laughs> there was not video. once wait knock again um, yeah. Oh, you know the knock. Aaron is, <laughs> Aaron is totally cool, Brother Baker, as we call him. I love Brother him. Ba nice guy, great bodybuilder, competed during the toughest years. He was there with Flex and Chris and Rico. Not Rico. Rico's good. Yeah. But uh, Paul Dillette. I mean, all, all the really, really Dorian, of course. So, um, it's during uh, that weird time when, like, the WBC came around and stuff, too, right? A WBF. WBF. World body, right. That, was, that was Vince McMahon's. World Bodybuilding Federation. Gary Stridham, all jacked and tan. Hmm. Stridham had a kick-ass physique. One of my current training partners <laughs> just found out who Gary Stridham was. He goes, Tom, you mentioned Gary Stridham. He was like 290, right? Dude, he was freaking crazy. I mean, everything but his back was light. At the 88 Olympia, him and Haney, they, from the front, stride him, stride him, stride him, and they turned him around. He went, ooh, maybe not stride him anymore, because mm -hmm. Haney's back was particularly good. Mm -hmm. But uh, bodybuilding first, but very close. A few months later, powerlifting. And um, in the bodybuilding show, um, I got fourth out of four. And in the powerlifting contest, I did much, much better. And I, I realized, wait a minute, maybe, maybe I'm a better powerlifter than a bodybuilder. Yeah. It was Chris Cormier, the IFBB pro that, that submitted that about 25 years later. I was training with him. We were running the same gear pretty much, eating the same calories. <laughs> I'd match him set for set, rep for rep. He was strong pound. too, right? Chris was extremely strong. And he won the Arnold. Yeah. So a pretty good bodybuilder. And um, he did a set of like seated presses, the 155s, and I matched him rep for rep, same weight. And then Chris would hit a front double bicep shot. And you go, damn. And I do the same thing. And you go, you uh -oh. get Tom, Tom, you're a better power lifter than you are a bodybuilder. Uh -oh. And I, that cemented the fact that you can do exactly what those guys do. Mm -hmm. And I mean exactly. And it's not going to happen for you. Can I ask you a personal question here? Sure you can, brother. So you said you were taking about the same gear as a pro bodybuilder. What was that? What what level of gear is that at? Because we always hear from pro bodybuilders, I don't take that much shit. Was it a lot? <sighs> Well, I, I never went to Chris's house and looked at his refrigerator. I'm not talking about that specifically sure. about him. What were you taking that was similar? Well, at the time, probably running you know, a gram a week of Scipionate, a gram a week of Dandrone Decanoate or Decadurabolin, a tab a day of Anadrol 50, <laughs> and probably 25 to 30 megs of methanodrosinone or Dynabol. YouTube, this day. is hypo yeah, hypothetical so performance anything. art. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this <Right>. is hypothetical <laughs> Thank you. performance art. Okay, everybody understand. This is hypothetical performance art we're talking about. This is not real. This is not true. Okay, go on. Thank you very much. And back then, there wasn't a, the drugs didn't have the same legal classifications either. So, um, you know, that was 
Probably that. I was definitely taking that. That was a cycle I would take all the time. No big deal. And um, then it would vary. Remember, we never, we never come off. We just change. You don't want to come off. You don't need to come off. We, we have different receptors, and, and different drugs utilize different receptors. So we come off product A, jump on product B, and then we use a brand new, fresh receptor. So um, when I said I was taking the same calories and the same workout schedule, doing the same cardio as Chris, I didn't watch when he was taking, I never took HGH ever. I just thought it was not a very smart move cost-wise. It was very expensive. As a pro bodybuilder, Chris used it very effectively. And then by that time I had realized, hey, either you're a responder or you're not. And Chris was clearly a responder. I mean, he was a winning pro bodybuilder, which is really mm-hmm. rare, rare air to travel in. And I was never even a winning amateur bodybuilder, which is pretty common air to travel in. So hey, Chris, <laughs> we're all in that same, everyone here Chris has started been a training, non-winning bodybuilder. He started training at Gold's Venice when he was like 15 years old. And he, was, that. and he was already jacked. He was like already looked good when he started. Some guys you can pictures of they walk in the door and go, this kid could be somebody if he yeah, wants to find. That's kind of what his deal was. And now we feel bad when we encourage him to be a professional bodybuilder. We gotta go, that might ruin his life. So <laughs> what, what, what are we maybe he's just you know, right. ch- chase something else, but not not professional bodybuilding. Yeah. But some guys you can't make them not chase it. I mean, once they get a taste it, they want well, to and there's bodybuilders. We've also are, seen people do a lot better without pro bodybuilding that have awesome physiques, like uh, my friend Joey Swole, he's super jacked. And looks mm. awesome, and he's made a lot of money in the in he's the fitness. He's made a ton of dough, and I was at first I thought he was kind of a kind of a douchebag, but every day he's pretty cool, and he's got a well, crazy physique. He was kind of in that click with uh, shreds and this and that. There we and go. That yeah. Kind of gives you that, I you know. You can, and I'm an old guy, so I don't I look get, cool anymore. See, anyways, what the I hell? I, see I don't look cool doing that. But what I like about uh, Joey Swole is uh, he's also very open and honest. You know, he went through an addiction like I did with opioids oh. and stuff like that, and he he's been very vocal about it lately because it's it's pretty recent. And I just like when people are putting out a good message and putting out a positive message, especially when they went through something that they might be embarrassed of, because that's really easy yeah. to be embarrassed of if you're a fitness professional and you go through an addiction. So I, th- I think that's cool, too. I agree 100%. And right now, I like his rep. He's very funny. When I see him doing stuff, I'll turn it on. And, dude, you can't deny that physique. Like, I, thought some, I thought it was, oh, fl- looked, I thought it was he, Flex. He looks, um, who won the lightweight Lewis? Olivia? Yeah, Flex, Flex Lewis, He looks yeah. incredible. I, every time Flex I, Lewis sometimes. Every time like, I see him, I get mad. I'm like, man... The Pro body, they make you mad. You either get mad and walk away, or you get motivated and walk away and they come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you can just go, dude, that's pretty effing cool. So now you just got to go, like, dude, you just shake your head, like, I don't believe what I'm looking at, but I, it's cool what I see. And like all the guys, even, even not us, surrounded by big dudes all of our lives now. Every day, there's somebody jack walking around. And you hang out with the boss all the time, like, damn, dude. You always say hi to him, too, right? You yeah. give him that, what's up? Oh, we, we have the big guy nod at bars, at restaurants, at the airport, casino, the across airport's the way. The best. A little head nod. Hey, hey, hey I'm, I'm, walk, I'm going into the restaurant at Harvey's, or Harris, about a month ago. I'm in line to get in, and this, this guy walks past me. And I can tell he's got some serious quality muscle. He goes, damn, dude, I got to get back on. <laughs> That's what he said to me. He said, word for word, damn, dude, I got to get back on. And he poked me in the chest. Like, he was a not like big guy, acknowledge a big guy. You know what the great thing about all of this is? It's like, we all, well, not all of us started lifting because we wanted to be all more attracted to women, but that, that's part of it, right? But the, the shit is, it's like, it's always dudes. It's always so I was like, dudes. guys, I like, do. Oh, look at your pecs, bro. Nice calves. <laughs> nice calves. Thank you. Yeah, the guys nice quads, dude. Yeah, one of the girls told me says, I got to get back on. It was, a, it was a gnarly, hardcore dude with cauliflower ears, as a matter of fact. He wanted to get back on because of me. Like, thanks, brother. Appreciate that. Like, who's your wife? No, that was good. But, but some girls will acknowledge it. Like, oh, they'll go, kind of gnarly. I remember, very cool. Remember Gabrielle Reese? Yeah. You got to remember Gabrielle. Yeah, she's great. Nike sponsored athlete, married yeah, Leonard Hamilton. Leonard Hamilton's wife, yep. Phenomenal. Athlete, gorgeous girl, USC, US, smart as a smart as a whip, totally cool. She gave us a Nike catalog. Oh. She was a Nike sponsored yeah. athlete for years. She goes, boys, here's a couple of catalogs. Pick out whatever you want. And Nike had about eight thousand different shoes. Ooh. And we'd circle a couple, put her name. Like a week later, she goes, here you go. She bring them in boxes and like, give us all free shoes. But one time, I'm walking out of the gym. I just trained neck. I was probably two seventy five at the time, pretty tight. Uh-huh. Neck, neck was over twenty one easily, but I had pumped it up to probably twenty two and some change. And she goes, and she, I was walking out. She looked. She 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 she's taller than me. Yeah, bro, I was a real six one. Yeah, six. Yeah. And she she goes, damn, Tom. And she she goes, oh. And I'm, what the hell is that? She goes, this damn Tom. And then oh, walked away. And I'm like, that was the highlight of my freaking year right there. Like wow. Gabrielle Reese acknowledging a my cool neck. right. And she said it away like, I want to get you and get you and get you. <laughs> and it was just freaking cool. Like she's acknowledging a 22 inch neck. That's hilarious. Yeah. 
Anyway, oh, and everything. You remember Laird Hamilton? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Laird's great. Laird does all these crazy workouts. Joe Rogan always talks about him. He does he workouts in the sauna. In the sauna, what? and he and yeah. he wears oven mitts. He goes on a he goes on a puts the sauna up to two hundred degrees or even higher. And you wear has to wear oven mitts, else his hands will burn, and things on his feet. And then he pedals on a bike mm -hmm. in the sauna. I believe it. He, I mean, he was. I mean, and he, he does did. pool workouts where he takes dumbbells and he lets the dumbbells sink them down to the bottom. Underwater walking. Yeah. What the hell you? Talk, but they do it. He he does is, all sorts of crazy when stuff. When nobody's all the time. looking, early in the morning or late at night, he'd paddle out North Shore somewhere in Hawaii or somewhere when nobody was there. We weren't there. There weren't any girls there. And the surf those monster waves, like, dude, nobody's seen you. You, know, you can just tell us you did this, and we got to believe it. But he would and do it, like, gee, like, dude, maniac. I, I gotta salute you. You are a crazy, crazy motherfucker. You know what's cool about Laird is he's got he he does this, but he does it with all this crazy group of celebrities that are like, it's just a makeshift group. Like, you know, Rick Rubin, who's like a music producer, yeah, Beastie yeah. Boys and everything. He goes to the house and does these workouts. He's like very into it all. You wouldn't suspect that he was. No. He's got the big beard. He like, you know, he looks like, uh, he looks like he could be homeless, but the guy's wealthier than anybody. And he's, he's actually really good shape. Uh, but yeah, Laird Hamilton has like a whole group of people that will go over his house and they train and do all these crazy. Now they'll do that. They didn't paddle out on 25 foot days. No, 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 no. They're no. like, what are you doing? You're gonna get, there's no one gonna save you. If you, gotta, if you get hurt, there's nobody to save you other than you and your two other crazy friends. I mean, they'll save you. They're the kind of guys that will, they will die trying to save you. But what he did was just crazy, crazy, like phenomenal. Like my friend. Well, he's a legend in that world. He just, you got a dude, that's something else right there. That's, yeah. that's, that's a real rare individual right there and really, really super cool. I don't. I don't know if you want to talk about this, but it had me curious when you kind of mentioned it. We 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 kind of alluded to um, prison powerlifting meets, <laughs> right? And I mean, like I've I've seen people go to prison and come out kind of jacked, sure. you know. So so I'm just curious, like, how's that experience? Like, like how that? Yeah, just talk to Mark me. Bell. We've discussed this before a little bit. Um, and I got no problem talking about it at all. It's, it's I don't put it in the highlight. Of, it's it's unfortunate shit that we. Um, but you know, you make the best of things like that, and um, if you can help somebody or, or tell a funny story about it, we go ahead and do that. But um, in, in the joint, where lift weights was a, was a was huge. It made you feel normal for a change. You're out there pumping iron with everybody, mm -hmm. and um, it made you feel like you were during the day at, when you're lifting weights in, in the joint. In real life, that's what you'd be doing at the same time. In the real world, I'd be lifting weights. It's one of the very very few things that in prison is identical to what you'd be doing in real life. Yeah. So you get a chance to have a little slice of your life back. And um, it, it kind of it didn't it didn't break down the, the the racial lines in the joint. Everything's based on race. Mm -hmm. This wouldn't be happening in the joint. This conversation wouldn't be happening. But in the weight pit, it kind of did happen. Um, and you would acknowledge like the, the big guy, not the big guy. You, when, you, mm -hmm. when you walk into El Pollo Loco, and the big guy's coming out, you go like, "Hey, dude, what's up?" Or maybe maybe even a fist bump. No one's just gonna have a nod of the head like game, where the kids say game, recognize game, or whatever they say. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, so in the joint, you look across the way, and you watch a guy bench press 500 pounds in the joint, and then you hit it, and the guy go, and you go, he's big and strong, and so am I, but we can't talk to each other, we can't shake hands, yeah. and we're not going to come over there and congratulate each other, no way, not in a million years. But, um, <clears throat> you know, the weightlifting was, was, was certainly a distraction, and the power meets were very, very cool. I mean, everybody on my yard, I helped prep. So oh, this, snap. oh yeah, here's what we're gonna do. Here's how we're gonna we're not gonna just do the contest. We're gonna prepare for it. What are you talking about? How do you prepare for a power meet? Well, here's how you do it. And uh, even you'll love this story. I had a guy in the tailor shop. And I, this is absolutely true. <laughs> I got a pair of jeans. Okay, I took him down there and he cut him into shorts. Then I got a pair of jeans like one size bigger, and he sewed the small jeans inside the bigger jeans. You see where this is going? And I wore oh, squat pants, wow. mm -hmm. brother. Then I got a bigger pair of jeans. <laughs> and he put them together as well. So I had three pairs of jeans cut off his shorts that were all sewn together at every possible seam. They weighed like 10 pounds. And they were a pair of like, it was like a super suit. Uh -huh. And I wore them, of course, and I put them on. And I trained with them. And they were great. They worked like a super suit. I wasn't going to blow them out. It was three pairs of <laughs> prison jeans sewn together. with. got to hurry up and make those. They were kick ass. <laughs> and, they, and they gave me a nice little pop out of the bottom. Um, did anybody else have them? Nobody else had those motherfucking things. They were uncomfortable. They looked silly because they made you look all puffy and poochy. Mm -hmm. And like, uh -huh. what do you do? What are you wearing? Are you smuggling something? No, they're powerlifting pants. And they come down as a guard. Powerlifting pants. <laughs> but um, I had those, and nobody else had those, of yeah. course. But I showed guys how they worked. And then I showed guys the basic rules. And guys who could prep, some guys, especially bench press guys, I'd give them a little bit of prep work, and they would quickly surpass me. And I was a big, strong guy right then, and I could mm -hmm. bench press. And they were, they'd, they'd catch me real quick. I, I'd never win the bench press portion of the power meets. But luckily, I'd do well on the squats. I'd do well on the deadlifts. And I remember one guy, I think I squatted around six. I was the last guy to squat. 
and I was walking away and he told his friends, he goes, this is what he said. He goes, this, is, this, this isn't this is fair. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> That's what the man said. And he meant it in the nicest way. But he, and he was right. I knew what I was doing. And he, they didn't. Yeah. And even though they knew the rules, they hadn't been they hadn't been squatting 500 pounds for years of their life. Mm-hmm. So the meets were very, very cool. And then they had the prison postals. That, this is legit now. Um, where all the prison not the wardens, but the, the athletic directors in the prison would send the numbers together to this headquarters somewhere back in Pennsylvania. And I swear to God, guys, every year, every weight class was won by this gym, by this prison back in Pennsylvania. These guys had elite numbers coming out of the joint. So clearly they had some PED. That was what, dude, what the, what's going on back there? I mean, guys, 220s, totaling 2,000 pounds. Everyone squatting in the seventh. Like, what's going on in this particular prison? This is this is thirty years ago, so I forget the name of it. But there was a prison in Pennsylvania where somebody knew somebody who was bringing in the gear because wow. those boys all had huge totals. <laughs> I remember I had my power few belt mailed in, and the guards called me and said, "You can't have this. What is this? You can't have this in, in the joint." And the athletic director gave me a waiver so I could have a power belt. When I left, I gave it to one of the boys there. It's, pro- it's probably still in the joint. Yeah. I can't imagine it ever left. But there was a joint back in Pennsylvania somewhere where somebody had the connection. Wow. And, uh, you know, in prison, you get whatever you want. You normally wouldn't get anabolic steroids. But that prison clearly got them. And uh, there was a big, strong boys back there. Everyone's, and all the guys are big and strong. Everyone's mm-hmm. probably wondering, mm-hmm. how'd, you get, how'd you get there? They took me to bus. <laughs> the Grey Goose. That's, 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 <laughs> I think Snoop called it uh, Grey Goose, wasn't it? Um, misbehaving. It like, tends to happen. Um, I got charged with armed robbery, kidnapping, false imprisonment, assault with deadly weapon, attempted murder. Um, Nothing serious. Pretty much everything, and um, that, that'll get you there. That's how it happens. And you got then, in trouble like kind of a, a, a handful of times, right? So there was there was a nobody lot of asked, nobody asked you that question. <laughs> nobody <laughs> asked about that shit. No, um, um, yeah, I guess um, unfortunately, it was twice. Once back in the early '80s, that was a heavy charge. That was that was worthwhile. That was um, that was some serious stuff that um, you go to prison for, and you're supposed to go to prison for. That's why they have those prisons for motherfuckers like me back then. They need to go there. Um, in 2001, it was this shit. I gotta say, I'm sorry. Um, you know, ounce of coke and a 45. Um, who cares about that shit? Nobody. Um, and they really don't. I remember in court when I was facing the three strikes law. I was prosecutor under the three strikes law. I said, I mean, I met the qualifications, so I was prosecutor under that law. And I turned around, and was it one person in the courtroom? Not one. No witnesses. No victims. Nobody. And it was my time to talk finally. I said, guys, everyone was being paid. The judge, the DA, the sonographer, the bailiff, my lawyer. I'm the only one here not getting paid. And you guys are only here because you're getting paid. And this charge is shit. I didn't phrase it that way. And you guys know it. Anyway, I filed the Romero motion. And I won the hearing. And the judge, um, he, 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 he struck all my strikes for the sentencing portion of that trial. Wow. Um, if he hadn't done that, I'd still be in the joint. Shit. I'd never get out. I'd die in prison. That, that's not an embellishment. That's what would have happened. But he granted the motion, mm-hmm. and then um, then I was just a normal guy with some cocaine and at 45. And they Did you get uh, reformed-ish from your experiences in prison? <sighs> Did you get reformed? Yeah, you, get, well, you, you, you learn a lesson. I mean, some of us learn a lesson. Some lessons are hard. Some lessons are harder still. Now you learn that's in the hard way, and you realize you see your friend they're doing big things, you know, having his career, your career, your career, and I'm sitting in the joint doing nothing. So yeah, it motivates you. You say, look, I'm not, I, you cannot keep fucking up because it's going to lead to this. And can they break you? No, they're not going to fucking break me. They won't break me. But then you realize, wait a minute, I'm not winning this fight. Mm-hmm. And the more time you're fighting them, there's just more going out the window. So I'm um, quit doing that shit. So do you get formed? Oh yeah, you, and you, you, hopefully, you get, hopefully you get a little bit smarter and we live and learn. But um, that prosecution really bothered me, and it kind of still does. Like, guys, nobody cares about this case. Just, you know, throw the coke in the garbage can and keep the gun, and there's not anything, and there's not. But they didn't have, they didn't see it that way at all. So um, that you first, learn? yeah, you learn. The first case where you just. Uh mixed up with some wrong people? I mean, or were you, did you think you maybe were, uh, like what what led you to do something, you don't have to say exactly what you sure. did, but why do you have, what would lead you to do something that was, uh, cause you seemed, you seemed like you're kind of uh, regret what you did and you seem like you, well, you yeah, had absolutely. a shame there's, there's around There's a lot of regret, there's a freight train of regret right there on that, for that, for that nonsense. And I mean, why we did it was, it was, it's not funny, but, as, as we were looking at the whole thing, nothing ever stopped us. Like, what about this? Well, we can circumvent that. What about this problem? Here's the answer to that. We need another guy. We got this guy. We're gonna need some, we're gonna need some guns. I got that covered. 
we're gonna have to get a plan. Well, any object, any yeah. any obstacle, one of the boys in the crew figure out a way to get around it. Mm. And um, all the guys are gone. Well, either they're either gone, as in dead, or um, they've moved on. A couple of guys kept playing that game, and um, they got killed. Mm. But um, it's a it's violent, and it's uh, it's. I mean, they knew the risk going in. They called me up when years years later. They had a job, and I said, guys, it's just, it's going to end violently. That can't be clean. It's going to be messy. You know, it's, it's $5 million, maybe six. I said, guys, it's it's going to end bad, and it ended horribly. I mean, Oof. the news, everybody got killed pretty much. <laughs> and, um, I, I had said wow. no to that whole thing. And um, I, I had the chance earlier on to say no to other stuff. Uh -huh. But uh, only one guy ever stepped out, and I still see him once in a while, and he goes, he ended up, well, he drove me to the airport one time. And I gave him a shitload of money. And I see him time to time. He, he was a witness, but he, he really didn't know anything. But um, you keep doing that, and you, you will get in trouble. But um, if they don't catch you, anyway, you know, you, it, it, at least at least no good, as everybody mm. always knows. How long were you in for? In there. The, the first time I got sentenced, I got sentenced to eight years. I did five. Um, and then the next time I got sentenced, I got sentenced to six. And I did three and change, so um, Man. in totality, hey. uh, approximately you know approaching nine years in the joint, which is just wasted. I mean, you guys had to pump an iron, you know, talking to girls, talking to guys, doing your thing, hanging out, and I'm in the joint, mm. doing nothing. So um, yeah, I, I hope I learned that lesson. But uh, luckily, it's um, you know, now Don King in America, you can you can make a comeback. Yeah, and uh, once you get out, you, off you go. And um, you know, my one of my lawyers said, look, it will only ever keep you from getting a really crummy job. That's what they'll care. A good job, TV and film, hang out with you guys. You know, yeah. they, they don't give a fuck, care about that nonsense. Yeah. He's not going to rob us. He's not going to shoot me. What about, why are they going to rob me? He's not going to do that. He's not going to kill my guys. He prevent you from getting a job that you wouldn't want anyway. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> and a cool job, they don't care about it. As a, as a little spice, he's now the st he's a straw that stirs the drink. I was called <laughs> that once at an MTV production meeting. So I, I was had good ideas for him, and they liked it a lot. But... um. No, it's, 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 eight, it's nine years that I can't get back no matter what I try. So I just got to go, hey, and if somebody wants to ask about it, I'm, I'm always happy to talk about it. But um, And sometimes I tell funny stories about it, but um, when you're sitting in the joint late at night by yourself, there's no fucking, the fun's pretty much out of it. Yet. What's it like when you get out? That must be like a completely weird... You, you know what it's like? It's, probably it's like, kind of the same like, like getting out of rehab. Or yeah, something. you, you, you got to start over completely. You, know, you walk in the Safeway and all the smells and the sounds. Every single girl you meet, you, from me to you, you smell that girl. Yeah. You smell <laughs> girls I'll sit like, damn. They all become hot. Dog. Every one of them. Damn, you smell. <laughs> it smells like a girl. Even the guys smell good. Everything yeah. smells good. Um, first tennis shoes, like, these are nice. Yeah. It's just cool. I mean, it's just for a second ago, that was worth doing all the time in the joint to have this sensation. I wouldn't have had it otherwise. Mm -hmm. Like when you break your leg and then it heals, you go, it was almost worth having that, that bad experience to, to, to experience being, being good again. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's, um, it's a shot in the arm and it's cool. And it makes you realize, wait a minute, this, uh, as all the crazy bad stuff, as good as that was, this was even better. So don't go to the freaking joint. Yeah, don't go back. Don't go back to the joint. No, but you still did. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody asked you anyway. I don't remember. <laughs> when are you competing next? I ain't telling you. Tops it down. Well, with all the cancellations, we were, yeah. we, were, we had a meet last two weeks ago. Old school iron. It was a makeup meet for all guys who had prepaid for meets. USPA. Yeah. It was a good meet. Um, luckily, all the big federations have allowed last year's totals to qualify for all the big events. You know, the seniors, the juniors, Ooh. the world championships. You always have to qualify. So my 2019 numbers qualify me for all the 2021 big stuff. In November in Coventry, England, there's the IPL Masters and Open Class World Championships. That's the objective. I'm already qualified. Um, now I may have to have my COVID vaccines to go to mm -hmm. England by then. I got no problem getting it done. Um, I haven't had it done yet. I'll do it if it needs to be. And if I make that happen, I can go back there. And remember, you can only break world records, as you know, at certain events that have certain judging in place. And it's always cool to break world records at the World Championships. And then, of course, I, I, I badly want to get the World Championship title back. It was just cool to, to have that title. And I know it was, it was the Masters World Championships, but that still counts for something. And you're 59? I'm 59, so I'll be... When I'll, do you turn 60? Is that I'll, a different class, too? It is, and I'll be in that class then, because I turn 60 in September. So I'll be the youngest guy in that class. Oh, what's your birthday? So, uh, 9661, September oh, 6th. right before Na my birthday. 1961. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, next year we're going to celebrate. Yeah. There you go. Um, so I'll be in a different weight class. Now, unfortunately, 
or actually, fortunately, the guys who are really good are my exact same age, they'll come up with me. Mm -hmm. And you want guys that can push you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this age group and this weight class, there aren't a lot of guys in the big classes. They don't want to be 59 years old and weigh 242 pounds. It's inherently probably not a really good idea. So most guys <laughs> get older and they lose a little bit of weight, so they're healthier. So um, the competition at that, at that point is, is usually a little bit on the thin side, but when all the guys show up, there's some big strong boys who can still push me really hard, and hopefully I push them back. And I know when we meet, go against each other, we always have good numbers. I mean, mm -hmm. all the world records I ever broke, we're going against guys who are better than me. And I have, and not me, I got the best of them. Yeah. Next meet, they get the best of me. And that's how it works. That's what you want. You don't want to be the only guy on stage. That's no fun. And I still do open meets occasionally. Well, I'll do them all the time. But uh, the real guys at 242... Those are big, mm. strong, hard-hitting boys, and I can't beat them anymore. They're just um, They're all squatting in the sevens. They're all benching close to five. What do you do to uh, to stay healthy? You know, like obviously you've been in powerlifting a long time. Avoid injuries. You're older than I am. You know, but I'm 48. You're 60, almost 60, and you still look great. Thank you. Uh, you say that you feel great. Yep. What, what do you What do you do to Keep up with, with everything. Well, contrary to this right here, most of my meals are pretty clean. <laughs> and uh, the gear that I run, I don't step on the gas very hard at all. I, I have to back off so I feel better. Matter of fact, I've made some substantial changes recently, last 10, 12 days, and I feel better already. It's amazing how good your body will recover. Your body's pretty cool, actually. You can beat it up really badly for years, and you give it a little bit of kindness, and all of a sudden, it, it, it responds. I mean, I've known smokers who smoke their whole life, and they quit smoking, and, and six months later, they have the same heart and blood stroke volume as I do. And then they're like, dude, I, it's almost like I'm unfair. Like, you can't be as healthy as me. You smoke mm -hmm. for 35 years, but your body's pretty friggin' cool. Mm -hmm. So um, I do I do some cardio. I know it doesn't sound like I do cardio. Um, Jesse, <laughs> Jessica, so last week in the gym, Jessica accused me of having wake apnea, which is, <laughs> which, which is, not, a, which is not a real disease. You can't make up diseases. This is serious. Which is, I always breathe. I'm always huffing and puffing. So she accused me of having wake apnea. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I have it. I am. Well, you, you can hear me coming and hear me leaving. <laughs> I wouldn't be much of a sneak thief anymore because you hear me breathing six blocks away. <laughs> but um, cardio still. And I, my supplementation program, I have a very clean, very aggressive over-the-counter supplement program. What kind of cardio and how much? Just well, out of out of where, where we live, we have a couple of really steep roads, extremely steep. So we walk out, it's 15 minutes out, and at 15 minutes, wherever we are, we turn and come back. We get a little more fit, 15 minutes gets us further away. Mm -hmm. So it increases in duration. But coming back, the severity of that hill, especially at 245, well, I'm almost 250 right now. I was 252 a couple months ago. Mm. Um, that hill at 252 is awfully steep. <laughs> so when my friends, who are a little younger than me and more fit, they step on, they start coming up the hill hard, I can't let them walk away from me. I try, I try to stay on their heels and I try to stay close. So I do that cardio um, at our new, at the Power Palace, our outdoor gym. Johnny Kashabi, thank you, sir, Power Palace. Um, he owns the property out there. Um, we have a brand new elliptical which is great for warming up. And um, I mean, I, I train six days a week right now. So as a power, mm. uh, again, when my contests get closer, I'll drop two of those days for sure. But now I have two leg days, and I even have two, as you can probably tell, two arm days. I gotta ask you. Uh, uh, yes, about my arms. Sure, what do you want? Well, 19 and a half. Okay. They're okay. not 19 and a half. <laughs> so 242, right, right, right you're, you're, six, you're gonna be 60. Have you ever thought of dropping a weight class? Because I mean, you did mention, right, that like, okay, maybe being this old and holding this much weight, maybe it's not the best, but you could still compete at like 220 weight class and still be plenty strong. Have you thought about that or that's not an option? No, no, that, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a clear headed, lucid exit strategy. Come on down to 220s. I can breathe, I can walk around, lose a, lose a clothes size, lose some of this mush in my face, not mm -hmm. lose some fat in the face. Um, it's, it's a great plan. <clears throat> can I take squat? Will a 551 squat be acceptable? <clears throat> I don't know that it will be. <laughs> if, if I can't pull six worries before I can pull six for reps, yeah. can I take that? I hope I can take it. I've been in wrong. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, and I gotta know that it's gonna happen. I tell other guys, dude, you gotta come down. You can't be like all the good Olympias. They've all lost all their. They're not. Let me walk. Arnold, Dorian, Lee yeah. Haney, they're all totally normal now. They don't walk around at two forty-five anymore. They've get, they said, hey, I did it. Let me get out. But I never did it. I never did shit. Yeah. So I, I can't let it go. That I can't. I won't let go of it. Like, like I kind of feel did. the same way. Yeah. Like I never made it to the top of the mountain, so <sighs> I still want to keep pushing. You know what I. I will try hard for you to make that happen, to compete at 220s. And okay. if, I can do, if I can do 220s, 
No, not good. 98. And I can weigh 98 very easily. I mm. can't weigh 98. Yeah, I can. <laughs> so if I, if I get 98 and go, you know, go five and a quarter, 300, 550. Yeah. Those are still decent numbers for an old timer. It's mm-hmm. awesome. Yeah. Oh. So um, th- 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 that makes sense. Yeah. And to get down to that weight, I'd back the gear way off, clean up the diet. This goes away. So that makes perfect sense. That's okay. an exit strategy. But can I do it? Yeah. Or do I want to still be a guy? I guess Safeway still turn heads like, damn, dude, that's jacked mm. at 98. I don't think I'll turn any heads a Safeway. Maybe some of the gay guys. <laughs> <They are. laughs> that's and that's, what, and, hey, and that's hey, what this is all about. Hey, hey all the years at Golden <laughs> Venice, all the guys who West Hollywood, these boys were kick ass cool. Love every one of them. They said, Tom, we're going to make you a muscle bear. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to be the, the kick ass, most awesome muscle bear in West Hollywood. I said, that's, pretty, that's a pretty tall order because there's some big good looking guys over there with kick ass muscle wearing those black leather vest and the boots. I said, fellas, we have one problem with making me a muscle bear. He went, what? What? That's a great idea. I said, dude, am I gay? And they went, no, we can, we, we can fix that. I said, dude, I don't know. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? I don't want to be a muscle bear. But then I would think, some of those guys are pretty cool looking. You've seen them. The little five o'clock shadow, hair, you know, gnarly looking dudes. Like, that is a hard hitting dude. You know, he's in, the, he's in the Velvet Mafia. But he's a, he's a cool, it was a good look. And all those boys were so convinced I could be a great muscle bear. I had a good head of hair, good looking guy, you know, when we were younger, like 20s. But I never pursued that. So. You should have. I, oh, yeah, you, yeah, you did. Right. I should have. That was your calling. You missed You're it. It's never right. too late. <laughs> that train left the station, and uh, it don't come back. Oh, there there it is. you go. Look at this. Hey, this Tom file. Oh, damn. That's 1983. You look awesome there. That's 1983 at the Iron Man Bodybuilding Championships. That, in that show. What's your weight right there? Probably 200? You know, uh, 202. 202. I tried to make 98, so I couldn't make it. At that event, you had to do all three power lifts during the day. Squat, bench, press, and deadlift. Oh, yeah. Great. It was, it was a legendary event. Oh, it's wow. called the Iron Man. Okay. All three power lifting events during the day. Traditional format. No changes at all. Then at night, you came back and got on stage in your Speedos. That's a great And then bodybuilding. Great you got, event. You got points for power lifting and then points for bodybuilding. Combine the scores. You had an overall winner. My good friend, John Sheck Snyder, won the whole thing. Hmm. He, he won 48. Um, as a little guy, we kind of overlooked him. And then that night, he kept getting the call outs, and he had a great power. He totaled, he probably went like 5, 350, and 5 at 148. So extremely strong. And I remember I was still kind of still kind of new to the sport, but when I see John flex, and I see things happen, wait a minute, he's got some kind of weird intense, like, what am I seeing here? I, that, that dude's a bodybuilder. Mm-hmm. This guy that's weights, me, that guy's a bodybuilder. And Sheck Snyder, he beat Roger Estep. Remember Roger Estep? Yeah. Great power with a phenomenal physique. Weeder loved him. All, he was on cover of every bodybuilding magazine. Oh, wow. But John won the whole thing. And it was a real cool show. Again, on the same day, all three lifts, and I beat you up. That picture right there was probably close to midnight. Mm. Because remember back then, the meat ran all day long. They get everybody out of there, strip, pump up, put on your tanning products, get the music out, and um, go out there and start posing. So it was a pretty cool event. But that's what that was. And yeah. you want to take us on out of here, buddy? Yeah, sure thing. I was just checking out uh, this video real quick. Oh, look at that. <laughs> just... <laughs> Tom's your neck, bro. Like your 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 traps just connect to your neck. It's just like this kind of like mound. the iron cheek with the at, like the. <clears throat> That's kind of an iron sheik physique, but you're right. A belly with abs. Hey, the sheik was not. The sheik was a real athlete and a big, strong man and a real good friend of Lee Haney's. Yeah. I got a sheik story. I guess we're out of time, no. But the sheik was a good man in person and a whole lot of fun. Oh, he's awesome. Uh, I kind of see the iron sheik there. I never really thought of myself as the iron sheik. Well, he's jacked. He was awesome. And he, in real life, do not try for that man. Remember, he was the Olympic wrestler, Greco-Roman, and he would he would throw a punch. Re- were you talking about it? He's throwing the punch. <laughs> the Iron Sheik was not to be trifled he with. He would uh, move those clubs around, those heavy clubs around his head, swing them around and all that stuff. They put you in the camel clutch, and that was over with. Yeah. My yeah. friend uh, Brett Azar is a bodybuilder from great. Gold's. At Brett Azar, he's a bodybuilder from Gold's. Do I know this guy? He's actually playing the Iron Sheik on the The Rock's new show called Young Rock. Uh, so it's about The Rock when he was young. I haven't seen the show either. And my friend is I playing TV. It. My buddy's playing <laughs> the Iron Sheik, so he got a pretty cool role in a couple of the episodes. That's totally cool. Yeah. I love it. Fun stuff. The totally. Sheik was awesome. The, the glory days of pro wrestling. Remember the Sheik and the Hulk and the Hulkster's feud? That might have been the pinnacle of pro wrestling. I mean, it was. remember the crowd? They were, well, that's what started it all. January 23rd, 1984, a day that changed my life forever. Talk to me. You can't leave me that's, that. that's the beginning of Bigger, Stronger, Faster. January 23rd, 1984, it was a day that changed my life forever. 
and it goes into the Hulk Hogan versus the Iron Sheik. <laughs> mm. Because that day, in my mind... Oh, that's right. That is part of it. ...was when, when the Isn't world... Isn't that began. cool? It all comes back around. Oh, yeah, see, full circle. Uh, and, and luckily, Hulk and Iron Sheik are both still with us. When, 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 how's Hulk doing? He getting sued or something? He getting in trouble legally? Are you okay? How's Hulk? No, he's doing good. Is he he's fine, yeah. And Sheiky? He's doing Sheiky. great. <laughs> I swear to God, <laughs> Lee Haney called him Sheiky. And said, yes! Yeah, Sheiky! I believe he's, he's doing Sheiky. He's, he's, he's a little, Sheiky. He's a little crazy. Hard. A little crazy, but I think he's doing great. Uh, oh, he yeah. was great. Remember his boots? Yeah, yeah. I'm having Iron Sheik flashbacks right now. LSD. Yeah, there you go. Are we out of time? LSD. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, like surgic acid, I think it is. Yes. Yeah. I get some of that. <laughs> my connection's got everything. There oh you go. God. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for checking out today's episode. Please hit that like and subscribe button because Tom File is freaking incredible. So we appreciate you guys checking out the live stream. Yeah. Um, Huge shout out and thank you to Piedmontese Beef for sponsoring today's episode. For more information on them, check the links in the YouTube description as well as the podcast show notes. Please make sure you're following the podcast at Mark Bell's Power Project on Instagram, at MB Power Project on Twitter. My Instagram, Twitter, and Clubhouse is at I am Andrew Z. And Seema, where can people find you? At Seema Yin Yang on Instagram, YouTube, and Clubhouse. At Seema Yin Yang on Twitter. Dom? Uh, wow, they can find me in Mark Bell Super Training Gym, Super Training Gym, strongest gym in the West, <laughs> or Old School Iron, Vacaville, California, or the Power Palace. And um, on Instagram, I'm Tommy Wishbone. You can just Google Tommy Wishbone, and it pulls up. I'm probably the only Tommy Wishbone on the internet, and I'm easy to find. <laughs> if you have any questions at all, I will be happy to um, converse with you about anything. Chris Bell, take it. Yeah, I'm at Big Strong Fast on Twitter and Instagram. That's pretty much where I post the most. So check it out. In your clubhouse too, right? Yep, Clubhouse, Clubhouse. also. Yeah. At Mark's Melly Bell, strength is never a weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later. Later.